This is Movies on TV Podcast Industries. We're talking about Shang-Chi and the Legends of the Ten Rings, the 25th movie in the MCU. Pretty confused right now because uh, initially I thought your dad should definitely see a therapist for his delusions, but, but then that dragon vomited a magical water map and now I have no idea what's real. Is what he said about your mom's village true? She used to tell us stories about Talo when we were kids. A um, village in another dimension full of magical creatures. But that was just a fairy tale. What if that's right? About mom being locked behind a gate by her own people? Crazier things have turned out to be true. Look, I don't know what the hell is going on. But if we don't find a way to get to Talo before him, he's going to destroy everything that's left of our family. This family was destroyed a long time ago. Welcome back, fellow defenders, to Movies on TV Podcast Industries. We're back in the MCU talking about Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow defenders. I am one of your other hosts, John. And much like the Sean changing his name, I am Chiss. Yeah, that will work. Yeah, what a great yeah, way to hide your identity, Chris. Yeah. Exactly. Take one letter. Chiss, it's Chiss. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think we'll just call you Gina. <laughs> <laughs> I still giggled at that joke uh, yeah, so much. Me, me too. <laughs> so good, so good. We are back, yes, talking about uh, Marvel Shang-Chi. We did talk about Eternals last week, the 26th movie in the MCU. We did mention when Shang-Chi came out, we were uh, unfortunately unable to go to the theatre to see it opening weekend, so we decided to wait uh, for a while for it to come out on Disney+, Plus, which is now available uh, worldwide. Uh, that's not a promotion, I promise. Um, that is, uh, we, we are getting paid to say that, uh, but it is available on Disney+, Plus. so we decided to wait until it came out there to watch watch it but will we reveal to our wonderful fellow defenders all three of us actually did get to the cinema to see this just at different times over the course of the last month yeah so this is our second time seeing it seeing it on the home screen um it was so good in the cinema my god seeing uh seeing this movie in imax was amazing uh seeing it on that big screen which it was built for but it is great looking at it on, on TV again. I actually prefer it on my TV. I'm I'm one of those weirdos for some reason. That Chris. is so yeah. weird, Chris. Yeah, and I think it's more just because I have a very big TV screen and I have the trans sound. Everything's the way I want it, and there's no annoying kids talking <laughs> or there, there's no people. I, I suppose the um, reason I like it at home is there's no other people. You're you're <laughs> the antisocial uh, superhero. Yeah, exactly. I I, I hate other people. It's like, I'll rescue you, but begrudgingly. Like, really. Just don't touch me or my cape, you know? I love it. I love you, it. Carry out, you go outdoors in your bubble suit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm Bubble Boy. There you go. There you go. Actually, no, be fair. I'm Bubble Man. There yes, you Bubble Man. That could be your superhero name, maybe. And it could also be maybe an upcoming series on Disney Plus. Did you see all the announcements on for Disney Plus Day, uh, which happened yesterday, the twelfth of November? Uh, so much stuff coming. It was like as if they just reached into the history of everybody who was born <laughs> in the seventies and eighties and went, "We're going to give you a TV show for for something that you're interested in." You know, we was- had we had the announcement of the uh, the animated X Men show is returning. Uh, yeah. With the original creative team, most of the original cast. It is thirty years <laughs> since the show uh, first premiered, so uh, so some of the cast can't come back and and, uh, and follow up on that. But I was kind of going. I remember watching that when I came home from school as a kid. Who's yep. this one aimed at? <laughs> this this is I this mean, is aimed at you. Yeah, I mean, it, it's ridiculous the amount of content. I mean, I'm not complaining, but it, it was kind of like the you know the church face or something, and it was the prize draw and just literally everything that you could possibly conceive of on the prize table being drawn. And I, I mean, to think that you know, I think even I was saying when Disney Plus first launched when are they going to get the content out there of course in the middle of a pandemic and now it's just like this avalanche of of new titles yeah. um yeah there was so much it 
it made me kind of um, want to run and hide, thinking of <laughs> all the hours podcasting well, to yeah. come, uh, and also just squeal with joy. Yeah, there's a few things we won't be podcasting on, but we will, of course, be podcasting specifically on the Marvel TV shows that are going to be on. So before we go into the Shang Chi discussion, let's quickly just have a chat about the stuff that we will be covering and the stuff that was announced uh, yesterday. Is that all right? Yeah. Cool. Let's do it. Uh, cool. We got our first uh, big look at, uh, at Hawkeye, which is coming out in two weeks' time. There's a, a full scene shown there, yeah. which looked so interesting. So many little details in there that, that you can pick up. Um, love the fact that we now have a uh, hearing impaired uh, Hawkeye, uh, Cliff, Cliff yeah. Barton, uh, losing his hearing now since uh, since Endgame. And uh, it's already playing out in these scenes. The comic book character is the same. So uh, that was quite interesting. Um, and we're going to get Echo then. We, that means we get Echo. Absolutely. Yes. Announced uh, that we have got an Echo. TV series, another character from uh, from the history of uh, of the comic books, created by David Mack, a uh, great artist as well. Yeah. So, uh, really intrigued to see what they do with that. Uh, we had the announcement of a spin off, almost from What If, which is uh, Marvel's Zombies, a TV show in its own right, coming uh, from uh, from the studio that brought you What If about that. <laughs> I know. I'm really excited about that because you know, even though we have seen an episode of Marvel Zombies and it didn't play off or pay off. As well as I was hoping it was going to, there are there is a universe for worth of stories of Marvel zombies that they can now pull on, and it doesn't have to be exactly in the universe we saw in What If, because yeah, and you know. and everyone was psyched that they did the Marvel zombies, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. irrespective of maybe where they landed ultimately. Yeah. So the episode of of Marvel's What If with the zombies, it, it was a it was a great teaser trailer. It was thirty <laughs> was. minutes long worth of teaser yeah. trailer. So yeah, <laughs> job done. Absolutely. Uh, some of the other stuff uh, that we saw. Of- Kind of for the first time yesterday, first footage of Moon Knight, Marvel's Moon Knight, which we've all been really looking forward Ooh, to. Oh yeah, really cool. I love the I love that they had the the white suit mm-hmm. um, with the cape and everything. Yeah, lots of uh, moons as well. Dare I say it? Uh, in, in the footage, mm-hmm. waxing and 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 gibbous and and waning, waning. moons. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was also lots of night, lots of night, lots and different of night, night and night, yeah. more some more night. Oh. Didn't see yeah, so Frenchy. Different- didn't see yeah. Frenchy, I don't think. The sort of Moon Knight's right hand man. Yeah. Um, not sure whether he's even going to be in the series. I haven't seen any particular yeah, cast. I hope so. Him. But if you want to know more about Moon Knight, we should always plug, go over Absolutely. and listen to Into the Night, the Moon Knight podcast, who've been doing uh, monthly updates about the filming and about uh, some of the casting for the show. Uh, they will obviously be covering the TV show when it comes out, as we will here on TV Podcast Industry. Yeah. But go check them out. Ray, the host of that show, is one of our fellow defenders, and uh, we've I think we've all appeared on uh, Into the Night over the years. Yeah. Certainly have, yes. And so um, Go check that out. We, we are big fans of Moon Knight. We are looking forward to seeing that. But we also got looks at uh, She-Hulk, uh, Tatiana. Anna Miss Lanny uh, as Jennifer Great. Walters. We got to see the back of uh, of She Hulk uh, and the side <laughs> and the side of, of She Hulk, yep. but not yes. a not a full picture of what She Hulk would look like. Uh, and we did see an appearance of Mark Ruffalo in there, uh, which we knew was going to be uh, going to be coming. But uh, we do see him in there in this teaser trailer, right? Yes, yes, definitely. And then we also got a, an extended view at Miss Marvel. Yeah, well, I'd say extended. We got a couple more scenes that we've got before. Um, and it's definitely going to be interesting. Um, it was now has now officially been delayed to 2022 after being initially slated for 2021 mm-hmm. and there being six weeks left in 2021. We kind of knew it wasn't going to come. Kind of thought that was happening. Um, yeah. Yeah. But uh, at least they've officially delayed it and we got a better look at, um, Kamala Khan and kind of her, what she will be doing. And it was cool. I again, so every single one of these, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I have to say the the teaser stuff really made me excited for for Miss Marvel. Actually, yes, um, I, like you know, just from my point of reference, it it just it gave off some really nice uh, friendly neighborhood Spider Man vibes, mm-hmm. um, and yeah. I, so I'm really looking forward to that uh, a lot. That along with uh, Moon Knight, She Hulk, I don't really know anything about. Oh, no, um, no, I have no, to no, say, no. Um, so. <laughs> I mean, I'm just kind of looking forward to to seeing that as a bit of a novice in a sense. I mean, I know she exists and I've read her in comics, but I just haven't really ever followed her own comic series. There are some really interesting versions of of She-Hulk, really interesting stories that she's been in. What's interesting, I suppose, about the She-Hulk TV show is that they're kind of advertising it as a 30-minute comedy. So, which is quite different. She Hulk is a comedic character in the comic books. There is, they do take a comedic look at her quite often. So it'll be interesting to see a 30 minute comedy in the Marvel Universe starring She Hulk, uh, getting people out of trouble as a lawyer. Uh, which will be yeah. quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. 
And Janina, um, the English actress from, many people would know from um, The Good Place. Um, I can't think of her last name right now. Um, she uh, is the, the main villain in She-Hulk. She confirmed on social media yesterday. Interesting. I haven't seen that. I haven't um, seen anything about her at all. That'd be, that'd be quite interesting to see. Um, also, uh, Secret Evasion, a very quick shot of the wonderful Nick Fury uh, for one second. And I'm not even sure if the footage was from a different movie, but he does still have the scratches on his eyes, which makes me... Think and old. Uh, Older, one, I should so. say. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that'll be interesting to see that as well. One final announcement that came in and uh, for our wonderful fellow defender and massive Spider-Man fan, uh, this one might be interesting, A an animated Spider-Man show, another the one they've had about 25 but a new animated uh spider-man show set in peter parker's early years in uh school i think it's uh spider-man freshman year um and it is tom holland's version of spider-man uh, that will be in this new animated show so that'll be interesting but no one is confirming whether Tom Holland will be voicing it. He will not be voicing the character. <laughs> it is the best. But sure. they were, they, well, we are pretty <laughs> sure, but everyone was like, they've pointedly asked people at Marvel and Disney, uh, and onto it, like the mm. journalists were saying, no, they're just not giving us an answer. And I was yeah. like, because they don't know. Wouldn't there it, is serious contract negotiations yeah. happening at this point. Wouldn't it be really messy if it was Andrew Garfield that voiced this? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> no, no, no. It's Tobey Maguire. Well, Tobey, yeah, circle, exactly. Or yeah. well, they mixed in all three during the course of the season. <laughs> or Nicholas Hammond from the 70s. Yeah. He could come back True. and do the voice. Uh, yeah. You never know. <laughs> you never know. No, I, I have a feeling they're not even reaching out to Tom Holland. It's prob- most likely going to be the actor who, uh, who voiced the role in, uh, in What If? Um, yeah. And potentially there's possibly the option of the, of the actor who voiced him on the uh, in the spider-man game so um yeah we could uh, we could see that but uh, but interesting that it's going to be in the mcu and uh, the early years of spider-man that's uh, that's quite cool i think that's everything that happened from marvel on disney plus day uh yesterday anything uh, anything else that you guys want to add before we get into shang chi no just some really quick then funning um kind of just titles just a reminder that we are getting guardians of the galaxy the holiday special we are getting groot's i am groot um animated show uh we got iron heart logo treatment we got armor wars again just a reminder that armor wars is coming which i think will probably either bookend iron heart or iron heart will bookend armor wars both being about essentially iron man's iron suits mm-hmm. um one which iron heart is riri williams the smartest uh woman in the marvel universe where she uh basically built her own Iron Man suit out of scrap. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that is uh, so I, interesting, I, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's like, going to be interesting. And, and I'm really intrigued to see if they do play off that fact with Shuri obviously being currently the smartest person in the yes. uh, in the entire MCU. It'll be interesting to see if we have anything between Riri Williams and, uh, and Shuri in the future. A smart off, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then uh, Armor Wars is essentially a old 90s comic book arc about uh, Iron Man's armor basically uh, turning up in villains and kind of terrorists. Basically, they turn up with the suits and it was on Iron Man to then go find out how it was happening and get them back. Obviously, Iron Man is no more. So this one is about Rhodey sorting it out. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how that one works out as well. Yeah, that one's going to be really interesting. Starring John, Don Cheadle as Rhodey again, of course. Hopefully, he spends more time in that show than he did in uh, in Captain America and the Winter Soldier. Uh, I think so. He did get nominated for a guest starring role for his two and a half <laughs> minutes on screen. But hey, <laughs> he deserves hey. it. It's John Cheadle. He's an awesome actor. Um, right. That is definitely it for yes. Disney+. Plus. Uh, Marvel edition uh, from yesterday. Loads of other announcements. Uh, go check them out uh, as well. Um, let's get into our discussion about Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, the 25th movie in the MCU, as I keep saying. Uh, the movie was directed by Destin Daniel Cretton. He directed the excellent courtroom drama Just Mercy, uh, starring Michael B. Jordan, Brie Larson, and Jamie Foxx. Uh, go check that out. That was that was released in uh, 2019, I think. Go check that out. It's uh, available on Amazon Prime, I think. Uh, really good movie. Really, really enjoyed it. It's actually an interesting fact. It, that was the third movie that Destin Daniel Cretton uh, directed featuring Brie Larson who also turns up here as her, char- as her MCU character so uh, yep. they obviously have a very good relationship yep 
it looks like you have to question were they on site for this or was this just a second second unit just went off and filmed her in the corner somewhere doing this scene? for the post credit scene oh for absolutely this- she doesn't need to be on site they, they basically can do the star wars hologram uh nowadays you can just go and film it and stick it in post right <laughs> so uh yeah I, I would doubt she was anywhere near the set of shock chief for this uh for this filming <laughs> oh, i'd like to think that she was everyone was in a big room and it was a big kind of cozy get together I know, I'm, I'm imagining and guessing it. Yeah. I'd also presume during lockdown, they probably put her in the corner of her apartment to film this uh, yeah. with, a, with a green screen <laughs> behind. <true. laughs> uh, Desmond Diamond Crutton also uh, wrote the screenplay for the movie, along with uh, Dave Callum uh, and Andrew Lanham. Uh, Andrew Lanham wrote Just Mercy, the movie I mentioned uh, that was directed by Desmond Diamond Crutton, um, and Dave Callahan wrote tons of big-budget movies over the last couple of years in the just in the last three years he wrote wonder woman 84 mortal Kombat, and godzilla it, it, over a three-year period and then shang chi and the legend of the ten rings like that's that's a massive amount of of, uh, of writing of writing and <laughs> money coming into the box office like this is yeah. definitely a, an action movie writer yes you, we, we get this and we got this with chloe zhao in the eternals marvel are taking these what okay? So Just Mercy was big, and it was it, it box office big to a degree. But I would say that his name is now more more well known because of Shang Chi, because mm-hmm. of the both cultural impacts, but also the, the say the uh, the societal impact that it had, uh, and much like the director of um, John Wick who's now become synonymous with the, that type of action. Mm-hmm. And so I can see um, Cretton basically becoming synonymous with these really intense, both emotional and visually action-driven films. Yeah, I, I hope so. And, uh, you know, not, not to preview my thoughts too much, but yeah, he's been very successful with this movie. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that he'll, uh, that he'll come and do another movie like this, even if it's not Shang-Chi 2, two hopefully he'll come back and do another movie like this even in any other action movie in the future. Uh, he's also credited with the story along with uh, Dave Callahan and the characters in the movie, once again, uh, based on Steve Englehart and Jim Starlin's creations in the Marvel comic books. Great um, stuff. So just to mention that as well. A really interesting cast in here, a lot of first time um, people in, front, in in big budget movies. We have uh, Simu Liu, who plays uh, Shang-Chi, and we have... Um, Tony Leung, in his first English-speaking role, which I was really surprised at, uh, playing Wen Wu. Um, we have his wife, Lee, played by Fala Shen. Uh, Katie, played by Aquafina. Uh, Trevor Slattery, the return of Trevor Slattery, played by Sir Ben Kingsley. Uh, Zhai Ling, Shang-Chi's sister, is played by uh, Menger Zhang. Her first role in a movie as well, which is yeah. really, really interesting. Her uh, first role in anything. In anything, yeah. yeah. Plucked from uh, plucked from obscurity into greatness, I think is is the way I'd probably describe that. Yeah. Uh, Aunt Nan is played by the wonderful Michelle Yeoh, uh, who we I know all love on uh, on Star Trek Discovery. Uh, has been fantastic, but has done so many great movies over the years as well. Uh, Razor Fist was played by Florian Monto, and Death Dealer was played by Andy Lee. That's the main cast uh, for the movie. John, do you want to tell us what all of these creative people did and what they gave us with your synopsis for Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings? Sure. Sean and best friend Katie are living their life in San Francisco, parking cars for the rich elite of the city with the occasional joyride. They've known each other since Sean arrived in Katie's school as a young child with barely any English. When Sean falls an attack on himself on their bus journey to work, Katie learns he's been hiding a secret. His name is Sean, not Sean, and he's the son of Wen Wu, the ancient and feared leader of the Ten Rings. Over the course of time, Wen Wu has harnessed the deadly power of a weapon known as the Ten Rings. Shang Chi and Katie travel to Macau to locate Shang Chi's sister Xiaoling to warn her of a potential attack on her. Xiaoling refuses to listen to Shang, but both are attacked and brought to their father's compound. There, they learn that Wen Wu was testing their abilities as he needs them on a mission to find Tao Lo, the mystical homeland of their late mother, Li. But their father has been possessed by an ancient spirit, the Dweller in the Darkness, preying on his hopes that his dead wife is alive in order to get access to the mystical city. Shang Chi and Zhao Ling refuse to believe their mother is still alive and refuse to help. They are imprisoned with the last person that crossed their father, actor Trevor Slattery. He and his pet Morris, a mythical Hundun, know the route through the deadly bamboo forest to the hidden city of Talo. 
Escaping their father's compound, they survive passage to the hidden city and team up with his auntie Ying Nan and the villagers of Tao Lo and fight for the survival of both this world and theirs against Wen Wu's obsession to break the barrier where he believes his wife still resides. Shang tries to prevent his father from further weakening the dragon scale barrier that is releasing soul eaters from another dimension, collecting human souls to feed and awaken the dweller in the darkness. As he faces off against his father, he is flung into the nearby lake, where his dragon heart awakens the great protector, who comes to join the fight. As he confronts his father again, he wins the right to command the Ten Rings, when he uses everything he learned from his mother to best his father in combat. But as the barrier has been weakened by Wenwu, the Dweller is released from its prison to consume the souls of the living. He begins by draining Wenwu, who is killed. But with his sister and the Great Protector, Shang uses the Ten Rings to destroy the Dweller and accept his powerful destiny. Big movie with lots going on. First, obviously, story in the Marvel Cinematic Universe of Shang-Chi. Um, so lots to cover, lots to kind of create this um, epic movie, really. It's uh, it's just over two hours and 15 minutes, I think, is, is about that- the runtime, which is yeah. actually not dissimilar to uh, to Eternals, which we spoke about last week. Um, Eternals introducing 10 individual characters, Shang-Chi introducing this whole new world and whole new society that we haven't seen before. Uh, I was going to say indiv- 10 individual rings, if you will. Well, yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, what I was really intrigued to see, and I've, I've, I've read a lot of Shang-Chi comics over the years, but what I was really intrigued to see, well, researching for uh, the podcast is that this has really been uh, a project that has been in development for many, many years. Uh, Stan Lee originally wanted uh, Brandon Lee, the son of Bruce Lee, to play uh, Shang-Chi back in 1990, I think it was, 1991, um, before the uh, the bankruptcy that uh, almost killed Marvel Comics. Um, but it was originally a plan that this was going to be something all the way back then. But there's also been directors attached to this movie in 2001 and 2005, two different directors supposed to be bringing this project to life. So really interestingly, we could have had this much, much earlier on in the MCU. Uh, we're now in phase four. We're now getting brand new characters being introduced to the, to the uh, world of the MCU. But we yeah. could have had this character in much, much earlier. Yeah, it's interesting. And um, I'm, to be honest, I guess things play out for a reason, if you are to believe um, fate and, and destiny. And I, I think, you know, I'm glad it's come out when it is. Mm-hmm. I Because, you know, it, it's able to link in with something, you know, like with Wong. Um, there's, there's a lot of world building has happened in the MCU previously around... Mm-hmm. Um, magic and mysticism. And so, in, in a sense, this movie doesn't have to deal with that. It can just sort of plunge you, uh, right in. And, uh, like, I mean, for me personally, um, this is up there with one of my favorite movies, um, because I, I just thought it was so well done. Mm-hmm. Just everything about it, the, the, just the performances, but just that lovely mix of the the comedy side of it, certainly from Aquafina, mm-hmm. and but also just the emotion. And um, I, I think when Wu is literally, and I put in in uh, inverted commas, um, the best bad guy. And I don't think he is a bad guy, but I think probably one of the best um, dubious characters ever in the MCU, yeah. if not for me, my top uh, character. I thought Tony Leung was just phenomenal and um, just that whole character interaction between him and Shang-Chi mm-hmm. uh, and all the flashbacks um, yep. was perfect. Absolutely. Yep. How about yourself, Chris, an overall kind of view of the movie as well? Overall, to me, so the, out of the last three, so this film... Eternals and Black Widow, so the, the the beginning of Phase Four. This to me has been the greatest. Mm-hmm. Um, it really outshines anything, and it, I, to, I wasn't expecting it. I welled up in the cinema at some of these scenes yeah. because they're just perfectly emotional, right balance, and visual spectacles. And at home last night, I felt that same emotion. Yeah, yeah. and it's not. Endgame is the closest I've got to that. Mm-hmm. Okay. In a long time. Yep. Um, and it's kind of like, okay, you, they have created something special in this. Absolutely. I am glad they waited until now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think Marvel's 
the Marvel audience. I don't think the overall cinema goer Marvel audience, the MCU audience, were would be ready un- until this point uh, for this type of film. Um, there are now I being there are some problems with the film um and i think just the 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 biggest one for me is they kill off they do the marvel thing they kill off the villain <laughs> well they kill off the bad guy right and i think as m- i really wish we could have got a uh, tony in it later on oh yeah further yeah. down the road well, yeah i thought you were talking about the dweller in the darkness then in no, terms no, of no, the no, no 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 yeah, yeah. okay yeah. no 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 <laughs> Apparently he sh- he's immortal. <laughs> not yeah, anymore. No, no, he, not he anymore. Compl- not no, anymore. No, no, no. <laughs> um, he, he he's he's emulated. No, yeah, that, does, <laughs> that does not work. So close. Well, we will talk about everything today yes. with the movie. Uh, but one thing to say, obviously, is that well, Wu is a character that lasted for a thousand years. So there are loads of possibilities of flashbacks that we could see Tony Leung uh, come back in a future Shang-Chi movie, uh, potentially, or some other movies where uh, which take place at the same time in the history of the MCU. But yes, we may not see him appear in future after that uh, after that moment, I suppose. Very unlikely. Yes. <laughs> we'll see him again. Very, very, very unlikely, uh, unless yeah. his, his soul is returned. Let's get into our discussion about the movie uh, overall. Let's get into our top moments that kind of were of interest to us uh, while watching the movie. Uh, the first thing that really stands out to me is our introduction to Shang, um, this character that Shang-Chi has created for himself in America, and how different this is for a Marvel movie. The kind of, uh, I, I think I've called it the directionless life of Shang and uh, and Katie. Um, I really like this setup for this character, this kind of lazy life that he's living. You're expecting from the opening scenes and the fact that this is a movie built around him, that the, he is going to be in um, a very rich kind of side of society. Uh, they play on that a little bit as you see him getting dressed into his uh, into his uh, his kind of suit to go to work, and then they they show you somebody getting out of a really fast sports car, and it's not him at all. He's actually just a valet Parker, yeah. um, working alongside his his childhood friend. I love this setup. I think that's uh, that's really interesting to see. Yeah, I, I really I really like that sort of um, you know the music, uh, the flashy car, all that, and mm-hmm. then obviously. He's he's the the valet um for 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 the cars and yeah. um I, I I thought this was really good I also loved the I loved him going for breakfast um at Katie's house mm-hmm. I loved um Katie's brother who's like why is he over here eating our food every every morning um just really nice and Absolutely. and that connection with you know because this is. Um, with Asian Americans and di- the the cast, the direction, uh, um, as, and that element of it, I really like. You know, seeing the grandmother and the mother, and um, having that kind of you know cultural battle in amongst the family, yeah. like I guess all families do for whatever reasons, whether it's just purely generational or or whether it's you know it, as an immigrant family, yeah. that people who have brought up in their their home country like of china and of the kids growing up in america and and all the different um sort of uh just views that that get thrown out so i i love the grandmother have you know setting the place uh, at the breakfast table mm-hmm. for her her dead husband uh keeping the the memory the spirit alive you know with the packet of cigarettes and the the the, the onion rings and mm-hmm. um, yeah this was just really nice and and i like the fact that both katie and sean are, are like well we like our valet parking yes you want us to be a doctor and we, and we have the 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 friends where she has sort of you know in quotes grown up and yeah. become the lawyer and um, and you know this is this is a real sort of nice kind of just encapsulation of things and it's i just think it's done really well and it just sets that that lovely context for these two characters yeah. of of Sean and Katie. There is such a weight on um, directors doing these kind of movies. You know, the, 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 whole, the whole push behind it is that we haven't seen an Asian American superhero before. We haven't seen an Asian American leading uh, this type of movie before, especially in the MCU. This is the first time. So there is that kind of weight um, on them, it feels, to make sure that they're covering it off as well as they possibly can to cover off the different experience that an immigrant is having uh, in America. But I love that I love that just in this one scene they encapsulate all sides of it. You know, we have 
um, Katie's mother giving out to her saying, you know, we didn't move over here to, to give you this life. And she's kind of going, but mom, you're American. It was granddad and grandmom that moved over here. You're, you've been American your whole life kind of thing. So this is a third generation American is uh, with Katie. Um, Shang has come directly from, from China uh, and, and come in and, uh, into her life and they've been living together. But I, I do kind of like the pushback of going, I love my life. I love that in America, I can live here, park cars for, <laughs> for a living. And that can be my life. I can do whatever I want to. I'm having fun. And I can also stay up late and go out to karaoke bars and enjoy myself on a weeknight. You know, <laughs> that's, that's, I love the kind of pushback between those different types of, uh, expectations that are coming from yeah. the family, I suppose. Um, I love the karaoke bit as well. The idea of shall we, shan't we? You know, it's three o'clock in the morning. And, oh, uh, and, right? and then off, you know, the cut to the, the karaoke. Um, really good. Loved it. Yeah. I, I have to say, when this movie came out um, originally in the cinema, there was a great comment uh, about uh, Lil Nas X um, that he must have survived the snap because they're singing his song Old Town Road, <laughs> which came out in 2019, the year after the snap. So we know Lil Nas X was safe from the snap of Thanos, <laughs> which I love that somebody put that together. Uh, classic, uh, classic Twitter moment. I love that. Look, even the the the, the fact now that the the snap has become like just a thing in the background for people that like you do you see their the front discussion with the friend when they're sitting at the table and it's like you can't be like just valeting for the rest of your life you can't have just directionless fun because you, we live in a world where you can just snap away half the population yeah. and i'm like yeah that's like that's just a thing in the background now <laughs> Absolutely. And great. actually speaking at the background, uh, you notice in a number of scenes, there's support groups been set up for anybody that may have been affected by uh, yeah. by the snap, which I thought was quite interesting. As, as Sean's walking down the streets uh, of San Francisco, you see all these signs up going, you know, have you been affected by this? Um, an interesting difference that I that I noticed, and it only came to me after watching the movie the second time, uh, San Francisco is where um, Ant-Man's from. Mm-hmm. It is that city where we saw Scott Lang walking back to his home and it looked completely destroyed. It looked like there hadn't been uh, any garbage men going down the streets for about two or three years. Um, it looked completely destroyed. And we now see uh, San Francisco in a slightly different light uh, in the well, centre of the city. Yeah, right? thankfully. Thankfully, mm. exactly. I know yeah. that's always been one of your complaints about, uh, about uh, Endgame and Infinity War, John, that... Uh, that why aren't people picking up their rubbish? It's been five oh, years. Oh yeah, I, I know. It's kind of like all of a sudden. I mean, I I I get it. it, it it's trying to you know, it's that jolt of something's changed, and mm-hmm. I, I get it. But it, yeah, it was good to see that they have picked themselves up after yeah. the the snap and decided to collect the rubbish from outside people's houses. Um, and everybody's for back sure. There as well. yes. So, yes, and and also you know, I think West Coast America uh, because that is the that's part of America and the same with Canada with Vancouver that that faces the Pacific and to Asia and that's where a lot of Asians ha- have moved to America is, is through that route mm-hmm. uh, and you have the that culture um, established within you know the great cities along along the the west coast of of North America so uh, you know it's a perfect place to set it mm-hmm. and you know it's deliberate and I really really like that and again it just adds to the um the superheroes beginning to form on the west coast of america oh, exactly. uh, as Will well we get the west coast avengers uh, at some point in the future i'm sure it's, uh, it can be set up that way um one thing i do want to say before we get on to the big action scene that takes place early on in the movie um these two actors aquafina and simu liu work so well together for me i think they are yeah they're just perfectly cast as Great friends living a directionless life. I think that's that's my my description for the two of them. I love that they're able to just banter off each other, and when they get a little bit of criticism from a friend, as you mentioned, the one that's gone on to uh, to greater things, the two of them are able to completely dismiss it and then go off and and go drinking and and singing karaoke into uh, into late at night, and it feels realistic that the two of them would be able to would be supporting each other in their uh, in their lack of direction. <laughs> I, I do love that. By the end of it, they do they do fall in love. Or at least start dating. I was going to say that. I don't think they do start dating at all. I think this entire story is about their friendship and about how strong their friendship is. I, I'm really um, happy that Marvel didn't double down. I'm not saying that they won't date in the future, but I'm really happy that there doesn't seem to be a relationship between the two of them. They've gone through an experience together and they certainly are in love. 
But everybody else seems to have that pressure on them of when are you getting married? When are you getting a relationship? Yeah, it's, it's platonic, um, from at least for me. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's really good because it, it it's that support structure of, of, of friends at which you see as it moves through the movie. Um, and certainly given the, the jolt to that with what happens um, in um, in San Francisco with the, the battle mm-hmm. on the bus. And also... In, in in Tao Lo later where you know we we hear that Shangxi did go and you know carry out the orders of his father um so it was really really like good and because Katie is just there for him yeah. And, yeah. and I think it's really good and I the thing that I loved about her was after the the boss battle where she just says, you know, you can explain everything on the plane. And yes. it's just like, I don't care. I'm coming with you. And I was like, love it. Yeah. Fantastic. I, Chris, I'm Chris, of the opinion. Why do you think that there's a relationship between the two of them? I'd love to know. Just at the end. At the end is the, 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 the head on the shoulder that the, it moved from platonic to something more based on the head on the shoulder at the very end of entire Lao. And then, uh, when they are leaving the restaurant and, um, things like that. I just, I, I, I get the feeling that it's moved beyond just based on kind of the body language, the touching, but I think they've left it purposely open mm-hmm. to, to decide on when they go into number two, like whether they, where they want to take that, but they haven't just like showed, that's why they didn't show them kiss. I'm pretty sure there was probably a kiss scene in there at the end okay. and they just took it out to be, to give that ambiguity, uh, because they're just there's like the touching and the feely and all that type. I don't think that. This, I, think, I think this is just about them accepting their destiny and becoming the people who they were supposed to be. And the fact that the two of them have gone through this experience together has made them even closer than they were just as being kids. Because remember, this is all about the fact that they met when they were young children, and he has never revealed to her his real history. He now has, and they've gone through this experience together. So I don't think there was something edited out of it. I think the approach they were taking in the movie was, these are good friends going through an experience together. But I do love, in that scene with the family, that the that her grandmother's asking uh, Shang, just as Katie walks out of the room, um, so when are you two getting married? As if she yeah. doesn't still understand their relationship as to why this guy has been coming over every morning for possibly 10 years if, eating their breakfast. Well, exactly. Yeah. If you Maybe they're just friends with benefits, okay? Right. Their benefits include breakfast in the morning and karaoke at night. Well, I say, yeah. I'm going to get seriously worried if you ever rest your head on my shoulder. Do, do, because I may want to karaoke with you and come over for breakfast there you go let's talk about the bus battle in uh, in san francisco this massive battle sequence now what i loved about this when i saw the set of it was this was a central feature of the release of the trailer this bus battle mm-hmm. i did not expect a 10 minute battle on a bus um in the cinema the, the kind of couple of minutes i saw in the trailer i thought that was going to be it because i kind of got a beginning middle and end in that trailer of this one minute bus fight but it is amazingly choreographed um if you guys haven't seen the making of um documentary that's on disney plus there's the assembled documentary it's about an hour long it's definitely the best one that marvel have done uh for any of the movies or tv shows that they've done they really gave a good background into it but one of the elements that they say about the bus scene that i thought was really interesting was the uh two of the two of the stunt coordinators had worked with jackie chan in the past and what they were trying to emulate in here what they're trying to put into the performance was the way that jackie chan uses um, everything around him in his battles, that he's not just punching people in the face, that he's using everything around him. And that's what we see here with Shang-Chi when he is kind of freeing himself from that uh, that persona that he's put on in front of Katie in the past. We see him fighting in an amazing style uh, through in and outside this bus. Oh, the bus battle, there are some really, really slick moves. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love um, Shang-Chi's move to get into the the driver's seat and mm-hmm. um, it's just like so unnecessarily complicated and um, but amazing uh he, he's hanging off the side of the bus and um, the you know and the you know using that environment as you say but also you know the comedy aspect of you know whether it's uh razor fists and um, blaze getting a little too close to his junk uh whether he's using <laughs> the laptop uh whether um he's 
just sitting down and waving to someone in the middle of the fight. There's some nice little nods here uh, to that style of Jackie Chan as well. Yeah. And, of course, you know, the other great thing is... All, all through this, you've got Katie going, what's going on here? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, because she likes a good joyride, she's um, she's a, a good driver. She takes over uh, to try and sort of wrestle uh, control of, of this out-of-control bus. A, yeah. bit, yeah, a bit like speed. Well, absolutely, yeah. I'm sure that's a, that's a reference for it. I, I did love that they had shown earlier on that Katie is an amazing driver because she did do that during right, the amazing sports car. So, uh, so you know, she could take over this bus and at least keep it on the road. Um, but I thought it was this was stunning. That was an amazing scene. Yeah, no, I absolutely loved it. Um, you know, it's going to be something special when you have the guy from Spider Man Homecoming, which is hey. You the Spider Man of YouTube? Do a flip. <laughs> and he goes, Hey fam, I'm back again. Uh-huh. Uh, now I've done some jujitsu and karate in my in the younger years, so I'm gonna grade this fight. And you're just like, Okay, they're they're starting up with the comedic element, and then you're I'm like, Oh so cause when I saw this in the cinema, I was like, I've already seen this fight. Right. I've seen this in trailers, I know how it's gonna happen. And like you said, you the assumption is with today's trailers pretty much th- like most of the scene has already been shown. Mm-hmm. I was so wrong. It, it, it's fantastic because it just extends and continues out and just mm-hmm. it like there's just uh, all the bits that you guys have discussed. And for me, it's it shows some of the different styles and the, that or the different techniques that uh, Simu Ling Chong Chi will show. So you do have him like swinging out of the bus. Mm-hmm. So you get to understand some of the, the gymnastic aspect of him as a character and that is brilliant and then you still as you said you still get to see the 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 base character of who he is so the kind of winking and waving at the girl grabbing her laptop like getting it cut in half and then giving it back going sorry yeah yeah Yeah. i mean do you know my favorite uh little uh piece of trivia that I, another one of my favorite pieces of trivia that i've heard this week is that uh because that's a hewlett-packard laptop that she's using even though it was cut in half it's okay. She'll be able to recover her PhD that she was working on because the hard drive in a Hewlett Packard laptop is on the left hand side. So yeah. <laughs> she's okay. I love the people research this kind of stuff. Yeah. That's, <laughs> and I could just read it out on the podcast. That's it. And I mean, like, I loved, um, the, the move with his jacket where he's taking it mm-hmm. off and putting it back on again whilst he's fighting the guys and the sort of the double leg kick to the size. Oh, yeah. And they were just like phenomenal for awesome. me. I was like, okay. this is so awesome. And, and one thing that did yeah. twist quite well from the trailer to the movie, Aquafina driving that bus, as I mentioned, she is a very competent driver and that's set up in the movie. But when you saw it in the trailer, it looked like she was going to be doing the Sandra Bullock thing from Speed, where she was going to be screaming, going, oh, no, don't leave me in control of this bus kind of thing. She's perfectly in control of it, but she's kind of laughing at the end when she finally gets stopped by the dump truck driver and laughing, going, we make a good team. <laughs> yeah. We're able to stop the bus. You know, I like that she's very active in this. She's involved in the resolution to it. She's, she's the one that does the hard right turn, which allows the bus to split in half, sending uh, Razor Fist uh, off into the distance. Unfortunately, he does get what he was looking for, which is the uh, the token that's on uh, that Shang Chi has been wearing around his neck from his mother uh, when he was younger. That's pretty much everything on the awesome bus battle. Um, but can I just mention, um, there's a character called Taserface in Guardians of the Galaxy where they spend pretty much half of the second movie slagging off this awful name that he's chosen for himself. And here we have Razor Fist and not one person brings up <laughs> that his name is awful. No, no, no. If anything, they like his style, mm. basically, when they get into the car later on. Yeah. Um, How odd. Yeah. I guess it's just a joke that works in space, I guess. Yes. Or space or, raccoons like it. Yes. Don't call him a raccoon. <laughs> I know. I know. Moving on. Yeah. Trash panda. Trash panda. Yeah. Trash panda. <laughs> <laughs> but as you mentioned, John, this is kind of the reveal of who Sean really is to Katie. And they uh, they end off on their trip to Macau, trip over to China, uh, with Katie going with them. A great, uh, great moment on the plane when Sean is explaining who he is in his past. Um, a, a absolutely great line that comes through where he's... You know, he's telling this really emotional story about um, about his father training him to be an assassin. He's uh, sent off to murder the person that killed his mother at fourteen years old, and he goes, "I was trained so um, I was trained so well by my father. I would have done anything that he asked. If he had told me to kill anybody, I would have said." And then it breaks in with the stewardess going, um, "Meat or veg?" <laughs> so I, I love the timing of the of the comedy there as he's telling the oh, story. Yeah. It's really fun. Yeah. 
Really good. And also the name change logic uh, skit from, from <laughs> Katie, uh-huh. uh, from uh, Gina to Gina, um, I thought was just really good. Yes, Sean being the Americanization of Sean. Um, yeah, just like Gina to Gina. Um, love it. Yes, and, and Michael to Mike, I mm-hmm. guess. Yeah, um, yeah it, it was, again, it's just another part of their interaction, mm-hmm. um, which is, is really good as they head on over to uh, Macau mm-hmm. uh, to to go to the Golden Daggers um, to find uh, his sister, um, Jialing. Yeah. This is my favourite bit. Yeah. Love this it. really is. It's just so much about this. So Macau is, looks beautiful mm-hmm. uh, in so many levels. Uh, it's like the Las vegas type yeah. element of uh, China. Mm-hmm. And you see this just dilapidated like elevator, yeah. and I'm like, where's this going? I love Kenny's reaction, though. You know, this is an immigrant story. They are talking about Asian Americans um, being in America, living by the kind of rules of their grandparents, and then we have Katie actually in China, and it's the first time she's ever seen anything it's anything like this. So I love that the way Aquafina kind of plays this moment of being kind of overwhelmed by how how amazingly different the city of Macau looks before she gets into the elevator, and then she realizes, mm. um, is this structurally sound? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I really love this introduction that we get is to John John to Rong Yi Chen, who is just kind of this over the top. Uh, he's like, oh, I can do ABC too, because uh, he's spe- originally speaking in Mandarin. Mm-hmm. And you then you just get the introductions to the five pits, and yeah. what an introduction! Absolutely, I love the flow of this. I love, I love that you know, Shang thinks he's signing to get into the club, but actually he's signing up to uh, get into the fight tournament. Uh, as we're walking through, we see uh, these great moments of a sumo a sumo wrestler <laughs> yeah. fighting uh, fighting someone who's in a, a karate gi. Um, we've got a, a Black Widow is in is in a fighting ring yeah. there as well. Yeah. And we also have someone powered by Extremis uh, yes. in one of the other, yeah. uh, one of the other places. I, I love this. This is one of those ones that was great to watch on TV after seeing it at the cinema because you knew it was coming up so you're able to pause a little bit and see uh, some of the other fights going on. But you're right, Chris. We do get quite a big battle going on uh, in the arena. I wish this had been kept a little bit more uh, silent before yeah. going to the cinema, but it is great seeing Emil Blonsky, who is abomination, uh, fighting the wonderful Wong from Doctor Strange. Uh, Benedict Wong back in the role for the first yeah, time would... without Doctor Strange. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, I, I love this. I love that they they had Wong throughout this. Um, I loved his use of the, the sling ring to... to um, to to use Abomination's punch against himself with you know the little sort of off the cuff remark of now you know how it feels mm-hmm. um, and and ultimately that these two anyway are seemingly sort of sparring partners anyway as they head off after the fight uh, really nice touch here with um, with with Benedict Wong yeah. um, coming back as Wong and uh, this whole fight pit thing was great i love that you know shang chi is now known as bus boy because of the um because of the the video being taken by the youtuber on the bus as all the fights going on and elevated himself from parking cards to bus boy yeah and fantastic but it's just as, as you say chris it's just that feel it's like this unregulated sort of anything goes it it's Dark dr- web, it, baby. It, it's mm-hmm. drink it's neon lights it's money it's you name it and um, that is just yeah I, that that vibe is so great in in this and uh, again then to to have uh shang chi you know and and Katie betting against him, which I really like. Okay. Again, uh, pocketing a, a, a load of money, um, and it seems to be as well now. Maybe, maybe not. But the the slow mo knockout uh, sort of look is a new Marvel featurette. We saw it in Loki, um, with the sort of uh, cheek yeah. wobble, uh, and we see it here with Shang Chi when he, you know. When ultimately thrown into this ring, he is fighting his sister, mm-hmm. um, which was really good. Yeah, you know. Before we get to this fight with the sister, just on the Wong and Emil abomination. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wong sling rings open a portal back to what something looks like essentially like a cage on the raft. Yeah. Where it's this basically a kind of glass paneled 
cell. Yeah, and there were so red. There was red as well. Wasn't yeah, there? yeah. I was wondering what that was, to be honest. So um, Abomination's probably somewhere in the raft, and he comes out for these fights, and then Wog is like working on him on throwing the like kind of like low punches, you know, like just like faking it and that thing. So I'm like. I want more on this now. This is <laughs> I know, what I want. I I'm like, what does what side gig does Wong have going on? We need more information. Abomination is alive and well, and now kind of a good guy. Well, like, mm. yeah, like he's working with Wong here. I'm like, not sure about good guy. I think he might be just taking him out to exercise. It does feel like since we don't see Emil Blonsky at all, that Abomination is now stuck in the form of abomination and probably needs a good workout occasionally so maybe this is the uh this is the arrangement wong can handle him so wong could take him out they'll have a fight it's been established in the mcu that wong is absolutely broke he doesn't have a penny to his name uh he couldn't even buy a sandwich for himself <laughs> well that's uh, true back in endgame the last time we saw him so uh so maybe this is just his way of making a bit of cash uh so he can buy sandwiches for himself but we will see more of, of uh, Abomination. has been confirmed that the character will appear in She-Hulk, so I'm sure this is just a little bit of setup uh, as to where he might be uh, during this time. So he may be on the raft after the uh, the Battle of Harlem, wasn't it, when he, the last yeah. time we saw him, uh, when he fought against the, the Incredible Hulk uh, back in, in that movie, which Norton! is once again being incorporated back into the MCU, yeah. again, which I love. Uh, I mentioned it last week on, on The Eternals. We had a piece of feedback saying they were hoping that Marvel wouldn't ignore everything that happened in the Eternals because of some bra- some bad um, press. Marvel doesn't do that. They literally no. go, you know what? We're going to take it and we're going to make it even bigger and you're going to they're going to make this essential for you. So uh, if you don't know who this character is, you need to go back and watch that movie that you may have skipped right back at the start of the MCU. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, and we'll, it is one of our points, but it, it's like the introduction of Trevor mm-hmm. uh, in this movie, uh, which was, you know, is Marmite for some people, Absolutely. I guess. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But let's talk about the, the fight with Jialing, uh, the introduction of Shang-Chi's sister. Um, this is really well choreographed. Um, yes. It's not just the fight. I like that they have her thinking back on the last times she uh, she spoke to Shang-Chi. There's a really good use of flashback throughout Definitely. this movie, I think. Yeah. Um, it's not just flashback to a specific scene. I like that every flashback kind of gets expanded as the movie goes on. Um, and it gives an, each person's perspective on what was happening in those scenes, including when Wu Zhailing and um, Shang-Chi all comes out over the movie. It's all of their perspectives. You know, each person is affected differently by those moments. You know, um, we see that she's been left behind by him. We have that that conversation later on. And I like that this is playing out in her mind. She's about to kind of walk away when Shang says their father's... Um, coming to get her she's about to walk away and then she remembers why she's so angry at him that he left her there in her father's care when she was only what about six or seven years old yeah and which gives us the slow-mo knockdown when she come when it comes back out of the flashback Mm -hmm. um yeah i mean the the fight you know it's it's the literal fight between them but it's that that sibling fight that's happening uh around all that pent-up anger frustration disappointment you name it um from being uh siblings yeah. uh, and i thought this was this was really good and again Xiaoling, uh what a great great um sort of response uh, or riposte to, to shang chi you know he didn't come back after three days three days turned to one week to one month to one year and, and i love that she says and after six years i realized i didn't need you um, and creates um, the golden daggers and has her own life. And, you know, e- even seeing her as the little girl watching, uh, being prevented from practicing with the the army of the Ten Rings, um, she, she's off um, training herself. And again, the, the, there's that nod in the movie as well, where she says, I watched them train and then I did it better. It was like, real like the self-determination the self-resilience um of, of her uh so i i loved um i loved this character uh, and and the strength that she had um and just all the way through the movie but the, the, this fight was just that great introduction to her yeah yeah i this for me was just i loved this for everything you guys have said but it, for me it's just the the, the 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 choice from a directorial cinematographer point of view and literally just the the angles i think mm-hmm. that he chooses when he's swinging 
the camera around as to follow the action of the fight. There's just a choice to keep certain kind of either the faces or kind of the different parts of the torso it just in the center of the shot so it swings sometimes mm-hmm. um so as a way just to kind of draw the eye so you're drawn to the fist or the the kick yeah. or just the 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 where say um Sean Sean when Sean you know not Sean <laughs> Sean uh when Sean is um uh, about to hit her and then stops because of the uh, the the choice that that fist is in the center of your eye line, it's mm-hmm. the center of the screen, and a lot of these because it was filmed in IMAX ratio, it's filmed widescreen, it's filmed in the Marvel, the niceness. When you have a film that big, a screen that big, having it centered as well is very useful. Yeah, but it was just that it's a it's a choice like other people have them in different sides of action but a lot of these kind of key fight scenes have a center point where your eye is drawn and then everything else kind of spans out absolutely it's it's so interesting again to to highlight the making of for this movie the uh, director is so central to this but he has got fight coordinators in there he has got action coordinators in there who are creating the fighting to make it look really realistic and he is so good at the placement of where he wants this action to take place in camera. Um, it works really, really well. You're totally right, Chris. Speaking of uh, battles, um, the scaffolding battle outside of the club is <laughs> amazing. Yeah. This is yes. one of the most interesting fight scenes I've seen on screen in such a long time. Yeah. Um, just the the dance that's going on as, as Shang is swinging uh, through the scaffolding, Katie is falling off the side of it, and Jai Ling comes back to help them out. So we have not just three or four tiers of fighting going on. We have an entire building of fighting going on <laughs> with, the, with the Ten Rings coming to attack. I think it looks amazing. And I remember seeing this in the cinema specifically. And my, ne- my legs started to wobble from the uh, from the height up that's, that's uh, being shown. It really does. You really do feel that height but, um, of, of where they are in this fight. But that's it. You know, it is fantastic action on bamboo scaffolding but for me katie is giving me my perspective yeah. of oh hell no <laughs> uh, i'm not getting on there i love that um i it, i you know the, all the action was just amazing how they move between the different layers of the scaffolding mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff i loved it but i I was always there with Katie um, yeah. from the start of I'm not getting on that thing to when she's, you know, hanging out on a limb. I mean, whatever about falling and, you know, being caught at the last minute by uh, Jaling uh, is I was just, yeah, I'm with Katie here. I, I would have been a hot mess uh, at that yeah. stage uh, <laughs> for sure. I also would say this probably you know the subtitle for this scene would be it's raining men i just was thinking of all the passer passerby uh down below with all these guys just falling out the uh, out of the sky i mean it, it'd just be a shame that they would kind of be raspberry jam on the mm-hmm. floor um rather than you know sort of i guess nice raining men i guess uh, <laughs> but it, it's just like i wanted to see that's the only thing i didn't see uh, da- when yeah. when the camera looked down, I would have loved to have just seen this sort of sort of collection of bodies that had accumulated from all of these um, ten ring army soldiers mm-hmm. being sort of knocked off this um, off this scaffolding. Yeah, but uh, it was great, great action. Uh, loved the perspective of Katie. Uh, it really brought you into it yeah. um, as as the audience. So yeah, this was cool. Yeah, really awesome. Yeah. It's tough to describe because it just again is just a, so visual in mm-hmm. terms of yeah. how they the gymnastics elements of it. This, if anything, reminds me of like Tony Shand, like from like the raid, mm-hmm. where it's, there's elements of almost parkour. Yeah, parkour. Yeah, <laughs> um, to it <laughs> as they fight and punch and kick, and you see Shang Chi trying not to. Trying initially not to kill people because he wants to, or to kill the last person because he wants to find out kind of what, why they want, where is everything, where's the dad. And then you have the sister just kind of 
axe kick down going, don't care, bye. Has America made you soft? You know, yeah. this, is, this is very similar to her character in the comic books. Now, the story of Shang-Chi in the comics is very different from what we see on screen here. But but his sister is still heavily involved in the Ten Ring Society or the society controlled by his father. That changes quite a lot in the comics. She's still heavily involved and Shang-Chi has separated himself from that society. So I like that they still incorporate that here. She's a... She's a um, darker character than Shang-Chi. Yeah. Uh, she is still kind of going along the same side as her father. Um, she is uh, willing to bend the rules and willing to be on uh, on the other side of the law, where Shang-Chi definitely doesn't want to murder anybody. <laughs> that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of where it is. Uh, one final thing that I'd say about the, about the fight scene itself, and this is kind of indicative of how they've approached the fight scenes within the movie. It does really feel like they're ringing it for everything it's worth. They're effectively saying... We did a bus fight scene and we are using it. So no other scene that will ever be filmed on a bus with a fight sequence going on can can think of anything that we haven't thought of. And they do the same thing here with the scaffolding scene. There's so many great moments in here that you that you know they're ringing it for everything it's worth. Even that great scene where we have Katie being attacked by one of the Ten Rings and it turns out it's taking place in the window behind her and they flip the camera around to see what she looks like in the real world before she's hit. I love those elements that they put yeah. in there. It's it's like it's like a statement of intent going, you wanted a you wanted a big action movie with um one on one battles going on and we're taking it taking place at scaffolding. You will never see another movie taking place with a fight scene at scaffolding that will be able to do anything that we haven't done before. Yeah. So uh totally big props for for this fight. Definitely. Okay, well let's get to the central heart of the movie uh with our third point, I would say. Um, the heart of the movie, I think, Definitely. is probably between Wen Wu and Li. Um, Wen Wu being the father of Shang-Chi and, uh, and Li being the mother. Um, the movie opens really with the kind of story of Wen Wu, which I like is told with the idea that it's all myth. There's no absolute confirmation of where he got the Ten Rings from. It's just that he has them and he's lived for a thousand years, killing everything in his path to get money and power and, um, and respect effectively. And that is the was the only goal until he met Lee. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely. This is the heart and soul of this movie, and and it's not just with Wen Wu and Lee. It, it, it's it's their relationship, but it's the relationship to their children. And again, coming back to the flashbacks, you know, like we we've mentioned already from the fighting ring. I think this is literally probably the most perfect use of flashbacks um, for me uh, mm-hmm. because they deepened everything that was happening in the present um, because ultimately this was a family drama spread out over thousands of years and, and yeah. re- concentrated in, you know, the, the lifetime of both Shang-Chi and Xiaoling mm-hmm. um, with, with how their father treated them with uh, ultimately the death of um lee um but it just built the characters in the present by showing what they'd gone through in the past and where the flashbacks um ha- were were located um i just thought this was really phenomenal storytelling which gave the teary moments for me when uh-huh. it came to it um and you know specifically that first meeting of when wu and lee and their 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 opposite uh, dance, you know, the opposites attract kind of thing. And you have Lee with this graceful, flowing movement, sort of Tai Chi-esque um, versus the aggressive style, the the claw style um, that comes from, from Wen Wu uh, and just how she is able to redirect and diffuse all that aggression from his mm-hmm. attacks. Um, and as you said, it, it opens him to another side of him that he never knew existed. It, it, it's that idea of the yin and yang. I, you know, it, it, it's really um, central here. And I, I just thought all of it was uh, amazing between um, the uh, Wen Wu and 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 Lee. That that bit where they capture. To me, the emotion or the, the that connection between um, these these two characters as they're spinning round, and she's looking down at him, and he looks uh, up at her, and 
there's a softness comes on when Wu that yeah. you've not seen before. Um, and like that was just phenomenal. And then they repeat that with, um, I, I know I don't mean to jump ahead, but it's just that they, they repeat that when he's fighting against his own son, mm-hmm. son, um, uh, right at the end. And, but the faces are, are different. It, it's, you know, Shang-Chi has, um, has the look of of wanting to battle but when Wu it's almost like sad because it's come to this between the two of them uh, and and it, and for me uh, might, that might not be the best description of it but it, it's just all these flashbacks and all this setup um with um when Wu and and Lee adds to that and and with that little phenomenal music as well mm. which is really sort of helps um pull those uh heartstrings for me um i just yeah this is this is why this this is in my wheelhouse and and i i love that that tai chi action i mean i loved all the action here but the, there's something about that and we see it with um ying nan as well the anti uh it, it's just so pretty very you know um and and flowing uh, yeah. and graceful yeah this i agree total heart and soul uh, um of of, of the movie here yeah. that connects through this family drama effectively absolutely I know it's sometimes difficult to wonder why movies cross over from some cultures to other cultures. You know, the, these scenes here reminded me of House of Flying Daggers and, uh, and Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, these beautifully shot scenes yeah. that do translate from, you know, the other thousands of movies that China releases every single year. Those, these kinds of movies which have taken the, the idea of people punching each other in the face, highly trained people punching each other in the face, and turned it into this beautiful dance that can be understood by everybody around the world. Um, and I think they accomplished that here in Shang-Chi. They really have created something that is beautiful to watch. And as you say, you can see the emotion in the scene. You can see that playful meet cute that you get in every other movie. You can see that in there in this fight. It's effectively a character like Wen Wu, again, who's lived thousands of years and fought entire armies on his own with the use of the Ten Rings. He turned up to this place, the entrance to Tao Lao, effectively saying, I'm going to take this city because I get everything I want. Um, and walks in using the Ten Rings. He sees Lee there. He goes, well, I've got these, basically. And she just looks at him and goes, is that all? You know, a thousand yeah, years he's really effectively cool. ruled and taken everything he wanted. And this woman looks at him and goes, that's nothing to what I have. And she has the power of the great protector. She has this amazing style, which is the exact opposite of how when we fights, when we fights with aggression, when we fights because he wants to win, he wants to get what he wants. She's fighting to defend um, her town, her village, and defend um, her culture effectively versus this guy that wants to take over. And it is so beautifully shot. There's so much in it. Really, really good. Yeah, it's, it, well, it's also that connection around the, you know, the ten rings, which I I love how they're realised in this, mm-hmm. as his bracelets on on his arm, uh, you know, you see when he fires them up, how it infects through his veins as so, well, yeah. um, and when when he activates it, but also then as Lee takes control of them after he's flung them at her, that they they turn this golden fiery color mm-hmm. uh, not the icy blue that it, uh, it, it, they are when uh, when Wu has control of them and again this is returned at, at that final battle with Shang-Chi yeah. and Wen Wu yeah. and so the, the these sort of symbols um and and just how they are um sort of reflected in in this you know whatever about just the fighting action sequences then all this this level of the rings flying around it's so beautiful yeah. um it was just like incredible i i loved it absolutely loved it yeah so good okay i didn't know if they could get away with putting in a crouching tiger hidden dragon style because it is this a lot of this film is taking some of the best action films or kind of martial arts films that you've seen so the Jackie Chan inspired fight scene the the raid inspired fight scene the cage match inspired fight scene the uh the, and then this which is the essentially the 
Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, House of Flying Daggers, kind of art form, arty type fight scene. And it pulls it off yeah. so well. And I think it's because it's trying to get across the story. It's not yes. trying to emulate it. It is not a clip show of great um, action sequences from previous movies. It is telling you the story in a really good way. I think that's, that's why they've achieved it so well. At least it works so well for me. 100%. Because coupled with it, you know, after the fight itself where they, where they fall in love effectively, um, we, we have those visitations from when we, to Lee from then on, he's bringing her picnics, they're discussing each other, discussing everything about the world. He's being taught this new style of fighting, not with aggression, but with protection, with a relaxation almost to it. Um, we have the, the creation of their relationship that she leaves her post at the, as the uh, protector of Tao Lao to go with him, and he gives up the Ten Rings. You know, this whole storyline, it's not just about their initial meeting, it is also about their lives together and what they've given up for each other. They've completely changed everything that they have lived for in the past to live with each other and to become uh, become the couple that they become and create the children that they create. And Wen was lovely. Like, Wen was a lovely human being from this point onwards. He was an aggressor who killed thousands of people over the thousands of years that he was alive. He was Genghis Khan. Basically, yeah. yeah. I think he, he, well, he, he, he called, he called himself the Khan. Yeah. Like, he went on the scene where we get where he kind of talks about his many names. Mm-hmm. He essentially is the... He's Genghis Khan. He's the ultimate warlord. He is the um, the the great ruler. So, some of the, the pre-Chinese dynasty um, kind of... Uh, great warlords and then he talks about how he's Genghis Khan and then beyond beyond so he has he, he admits that he has many names yeah, yeah but then so he gives it all up absolutely so whether yeah. he's a bad guy or a villainous character in this movie he certainly was for thousands of years before yeah. meeting Lee yeah and I love I love that juxtaposition of you know the dancing game with the kids as well uh-huh. you know because as I say it opens up with him effectively taking on an entire walled sissy uh, and it yeah. ends up with them, you know, watching movies slobbed on the couch yeah. uh, under a blanket with the two kids playing the dancing game. Uh, like, it's just really, really good. I love that. Yeah, because um, they do say the Ten Rings aren't just a pair of weapon. They are something that's making him um, invincible or eternal or immortal. Yeah. Um, and once he takes them off, he will age. So he the, the, the line from, uh, from Tony Leung where he says this is, a reason to age is meeting Lee. I think that's, uh, and, and having the children. I think that's a beautiful uh, moment for, for the characters. But this all plays into the story. This, this idea that him losing Lee was the worst thing to happen in his life. Him meeting her was the best. Um, and it pushes him over the edge to the point that he does turn Shang into a killer. He tur- he turns his eight year old son who was really protective with, who was just, as you say, slobbing on the couch, watching movies, um, doing dance tournaments at night. He now turns him into another one of his forces, basically. He wants him to learn the power to kill his mother's killer. That's his whole modus operandi from here on after Lee dies, is that he distances himself from the love of his children and effectively is just looking to push Shang towards the um, the Ten Rings and towards the uh, taking over from him as a, to, when he returns to a warlord yeah. and pushing Xi Ling away because she reminds him too much of his wife yeah yep and i mean it's so brutal just the what the young um shang chi has to go through Mm -hmm. i mean with the the bloody knuckles i mean where he's being smacked by big hefty sticks i was like i i I just wouldn't be able for that um you know i i'm kind of there going i'm such a wuss (laughs) um that it is literally you know, someone would do that once or, you know, I'd hit, I'd hit the, the, the training post. And I'd probably just shatter my entire hand yeah. and I'd be out of action for six months and I'd be like, no, nah, I don't want to do that again. Um, yeah. can I, I don't know, read a book or something? Uh, <laughs> you know, I did joke with my wife. I was like, I really wish I had a death vendetta. Um, when I was a kid, because I would have basically, been, like, I would have came out a lot better. I would have been my best self. I would have looked like Shang Chi. If 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 it just took a vendetta like that and like being a child assassin, I would have done it. I'm yeah. not gonna because it 
he hey he's kept up the regime. He gets yeah. up every morning. He does his push ups to kind of hip hop beats. Yeah. I I need that. I like I basically pulled myself out of bed and tried to work out this morning, and it took about two coffees to even get going. <laughs> yeah, like, e- exactly. It, it's almost like. Yeah, I I would love to be doing all that spinning and flipping and have that sort of spatial awareness around myself to be able to do all these moves that that and I'm like, yeah, I I, I kind of I, I'm ca- like, yeah yeah it's it's never gonna happen. It's kind of like I, I'm, I'm like we could get we yeah. if we get cast. Like Kamel and Danny, like in Eternals, he got cast in the MCU and got the Marvel abs. We just have to, we just have to wait. We have to wait for our turn. We will get cast at some point. They're going to run out of actors for the MCU, and they're going to have to come to people like us. Okay. And then it. that's where they pay for the Marvel abs. Do you know? I was thinking about this. Maybe we should write the Banshee movie for, uh, for Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> Irish active, hostile yeah. future Irish actors. There you go. That's a way yeah, to get us that, in there, right? Yeah, there you go. That does it. Um, Sean Cassidy. <laughs> but I do love um, the young actor who plays uh, who plays Shang Chi here, and the, the, especially the youngest actor because you get more of him on screen, and it does come across that what his purpose is after losing his mother is to please his father. He is totally in love with Wen Wu. He totally wants the respect from his father, and you can see it from that first moment when he's being taught and effectively does break his fist uh, when punching that pole and um, the blood coming out of it. You can see that he's pushing himself yeah. for his father's um, love over and over again, even after seeing what his father does to the yes. to the people that, um, that he feels are responsible for the death of, the death of his mother. That's a, a fantastic scene where we see on the face of young Shang-Chi, him watching his father take out this entire group of, um, of, bad guys effectively who came to kill his mother definitely um, it's such a great scene we see it all, all in the mirror played out definitely and he is as well as you say he's looking for that affection mm-hmm. and the the love the acknowledgement of his father and um, but it contrasts with how he got that from from lee his mother and yeah. um, in, in so in such different way um uh, and in terms of how she um taught him her style of fighting uh, as well and so it is it is there you see the love for his father but there's it there's the tension that there's there's that outward force that ultimately when he goes off to do that mission to avenge his mother um that there is the decision made as a result of what happens there and um, where it, he doesn't go back to his father Absolutely. Uh, you know so i love that it rema- it keeps that tension all the way through and and you're right you know um that interaction between the 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 different stages of the family unit the different ages of shang chi growing up mm-hmm. uh, with uh wen wu and also uh lee his mother that is, is just as i say it adds so so much to the whole story uh, emotionally and, and the depth of it um and yeah the the young actor uh playing um shang chi is, is is really good and i i love the little talk between him and the young Zhao Ling as well uh, just as he is going off because mm-hmm. again it it connects back to the fight pit um of you know Three days turned into one week, turned into one month, yeah. and it, it just is so so good. Um, I loved it. It is, and I love both of the actors that play the young Shang Chi for different reasons. I love that it's just that innocence of the young eight year old Shang Chi, but the uh, the the kind of montage that gets fourteen year old Shang Chi to where he needs to be, the power he needs to be to go off on this mission. Um, he has an amazing fight sequence in in the ring as the Ten Rings compound. I think that's uh, that's a great sequence as well. Yeah. Um, really great casting for for all of those actors forming Shang Chi. Um, now we talked a little bit about the kind of flashbacks and the the expanding of the story as as the movie goes out. There's an interesting kind of element here that isn't release this part of the movie what we hear is that when we knew absolutely where his children were and he gave them 10 years to get yes. their acts together so that they could then come back into the 10 rings what we don't hear here and what we hear later on in the movie is that shang chi actually did carry out the murder yes. of his mother's killer and then didn't return we've thought up to this point that he left 
uh, went into the wilds of America and disappeared by changing one letter in his name. What, what do you guys think about that? That the, the idea that we have Shang-Chi who has murdered his mother's killer and he is a new hero for the MCU. What do you think? I love it because it's, yeah. it, it leans into the blood must pay, be paid with blood. And it's that mentality that he has to unlearn later on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's that all heroes have a, all good heroes, I should say, have a flaw, mm-hmm. a, yeah. a crook. A crutch, a beyond a crutch, actually, a proper, you would call it a flaw. So, like, Iron Man was the ego, the, the, in comic books, the alcohol, the demon, the many other things. I like, every good hero has that. Yeah. And in this, in the origin of Shang-Chi, it is that he, he paid blood with blood. He killed a man. Yeah. Um, at 14, and that has stayed with him. Yeah. And, he then leans further into it, going, no, 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 no. Now I must kill my father. Blood must be paid with blood. Mm-hmm. And then he goes even further and it stops. Right. Because that's when he learns that, no, that is not the case. The learning on that bit is sometimes, I, I on my second watch, I was like, he essentially kind of unlearns it by seeing a magical dragon. But okay, because he still tries to fight to kill his dad. And then unlearns it as he's fighting his father later on. But it, it, it's the complexity of, of the character. I, I, I mean, I'm totally with you on that. You know, it, it's that he does what his father has asked him to. And yeah. at that moment, though, the tension of how he's been and how he was brought up by his father and his mother whilst his mother was still alive mm-hmm. snaps and comes to the fore so that he doesn't go back to his father. But then... As you say, the anger um, he projects onto his father. You know, his father blames him for the death of his mother because he was there and he just watched. The crux of this comes with um, Auntie Ying Nan, where she says, you are both your father and yeah. your mother. It is that yin and yang. And that's what I, I mean. I've I've always loved that concept. Then it's, you know, your dark side so that you aren't that in your life that you become the best uh, that you have to understand that you have good and evil in you you're not pure and she you know in in teaching him and further furthering uh, her mother's teachings uh, at tao lo and brings out um this idea that you know you're beating yourself up about whether you are your dad or you are your mother and Mm -hmm. actually you are the sum of those parts and you are you uh, and you are a product of both of those and so um this is this i i i think it's then and the other aspects just reaffirm what uh auntie nan has has said in in this and um, and I think that's what's so complex about how it's been drawn over the course of this movie. And because you're right, he he is then again another blood for blood, and it's yeah. his father. I'm going to kill my father, but ultimately he's not his father, and he's not his mother. He is Shang Chi, and he Absolutely. is the sum of those parts. But that's uh, the wider theme throughout the movie, and, yeah. and really well articulated. It is about you. You are your history. It's not just about Shang. It is also about Katie. It is yes, also exactly. about Ling. All of the characters in the movie have to embrace the entirety of their history, whether that be where their grandparents came from and moved to America, like we, we talked about with Katie. They need to embrace all of that to form who they can be in the future. And that's the kind of central message from that discussion with uh, with his auntie Nan, uh, the best representation of his mother that's still alive. So, uh, so yeah, if he incorporates all of the elements of his father and his mother, he becomes the, the powerful Shang-Chi that he will be. And uh, that's the message to all of us in the audience, effectively, I suppose. Is, uh, is that if you're looking for a central theme from the movie, it is about embracing your history, uh, which I think is is lovely. Uh, one of the element that does kind of come out of this before we move on from Wen Wu's story is that this is the central reason why he becomes this um, driven in the movie is because of the loss of Lee. He tries to investigate her history, finds more about the mysticism of the city, and that's when this dweller in the darkness, this trapped uh, mystical creature, reaches out effectively starting to prey on his hopes starting yep. to prey on his yeah, the voices idea that there's a possibility that his wife could could be alive you know um 
and I like that he's convinced by that. You know, again, remember, this is someone that has some mystical rings from another dimension um, or from another planet uh, on his arms for thousands of years. You know, is it beyond the realms of possibility that something like this could happen, that a character that he that he believes is dead and his wife um, could come back from the dead? Is that completely unbelievable? Or should he still push to investigate it? You know, that's kind of his mentality. Look what look at me. I've been living with magic in my life for thousands of years. I can't negate the possibility that this could be true. So I have to investigate it. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed um, the dinner at his compound with Katie yeah. uh, and, Zha- and his Xiaoling and, and Shang-Chi. I love that dinner where he recalls his wife's death and this new mission. Um, and also, you know, about the, the names, you know, he asks Katie, uh, well, American girl, and it's, 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 uh, Shang-Chi, it says her name's Katie, and he says, well, what's your Chinese name? Mm-hmm. And, and just bringing about the, how, you know, the, your names, uh, link you to your ancestors, to your past, and, and so on, and recalls his wife, uh, his, his wife's death, uh, and as I say, th- this this new mission um, of Tao Lao before um, using the two uh, sort of green stones to form the dragon's eyes on the frieze at, at his compound to mm-hmm. to show, so, you know, it was re- really good. Yeah. Um, but I, I I found that again with with flashbacks in um, as he's telling this tale over the dinner table, I thought that was really really nice um, because. You know, food, family, dinners, whether it's Christmas or birthdays or whatever, reunions, then it's like it it's so it's like that reunion. It's like it potentially could go well, mm-hmm. but it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly, especially because they end off in prison. <laughs> in, yeah, in exactly. So how, how much less well could it have gotten? <laughs> um, what do you think? Speaking of the prison, what did you guys think of Trevor's return? For me personally, I loved the return of Trevor Slattery. I, I thought this was fantastic. I, I loved him in Iron Man 3. I thought it was a really good sort of um, just comedy nod, irreverent to the source material mm-hmm. and so on. I loved the one shot where he is in federal prison and is effectively taken out by one of Wen Wu's um, minions uh, and brought back to him. Um, That's and, all hail the king, right? Yeah, and it, it's yeah. it's just so fantastically weird how Ben Kingsley plays this. It's stream of consciousness. It it's random thoughts all pulled in, um, and I just really liked that. Destin Daniel Cretton, Dave Callum, Andrew Lanham have brought him back here you know no. that it, it's it's linked to Wen Wu where he says you know this man called himself the Mandarin a chicken dish and mm-hmm. you know when he says I've been known as the great warrior Master Khan and the most dangerous man on earth so I, I love that they they reference back to um how it it was a masquerade by um by Trevor Slattery so I I really liked him Coming back here, I yeah. um, really just like the interaction, the weirdness. I love the drive through the bamboo forest to get to Taolo with Morris um, uh, mm. and ju- this this weird chicken pig, and <laughs> that uh, you know, and Very and you see it on yeah. Katie, mm. you see it on Shang Chi. It's like, what is going on here? Yeah. This is so off the wall. Um, it's almost Monty Python esque, and um, it's complete bonkers. And yeah. I really, really enjoyed it. It's just the comedy of the fact that he gets away from execution by showing off his Macbeth. <laughs> so exactly, he just shows every does week, weekly yeah. gigs for the lads. I love he leans into the the scouts as well. You see the Liverpool Football Club. Yep. Um, it, it, Very close to your hometown, John, as well. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Um, it, it's just so, so good. Um, and, you know, and he's trying to be metaphysical and philosophical. You know, we have an ancient being here with Morris, you know, and, I, I, you know, he's communing with him. He, he, he's learned chicken pig. And the, the fact that he even, he thinks he's going bonkers from being 
incarcerated down in you know the depths yeah. of the compound he goes oh you can see him too you can see morris as well <laughs> you know he isn't um he isn't going crazy and so i i really liked this i i thought um it was a great nod to bring him back here yeah. uh because I, I've I've really liked this character, but he is Marmite, and some people won't. I happen to like Marmite, so for me, this mm-hmm. was a really good return, and actually unexpected. I didn't think they would, but I love how you know the director and certainly one of the writers, you know, are Asian Americans. They're telling that story uh, that they are comfortable enough to bring. Yeah back effectively you know the the the, the fake um that we've been introduced at, and to incorporate him here with morris um who you know a mystical creature and um, the the hundon uh that is lord of chaos and um, i mean just i guess his physical makeup is chaotic with no well, face no but face, yeah. um so this yeah i i, I liked it That's i had weird. no problem with trevor's return it is a really interesting choice because arguably the idea of the Mandarin killed the Iron Man franchise. Um, Tony Stark never <laughs> got a single, a solo movie again after yep. Iron Man 3. Um, and we joke about it. We've, off air ad and on the podcast, we've joked about it many times that we all really like Iron Man 3 <laughs> and like how it played out. And I don't understand the hate that that movie got because there is a great concept in there. This idea of the silly, uh, English actor being transported over there playing this role, but he has no idea what the, uh, that there is a reality to it, he's been uh, hoodwinked into this position and doesn't realize that he's going to be uh, that he's going to be responsible for this massive, uh, massive fights and massive battles. Uh, and now he's being punished here. I do like having him back in here. I do like having Sir Ben Kingsley in in the movie. I think this scene is great because it breaks up the tension of what we yeah. talked about, the heart and soul of the movie yes. we talked about here for twenty twenty five minutes. We're still in a Marvel movie. We still have to give a little bit of levity and putting Sir Ben Kingsley in here so that Katie can have a little bit of humor uh, with him. You know, that's that's pretty good. And they can have a bit of humor. But he drops out so dramatically yeah. later on in the movie. It's like, was he ever in the movie at some point? You're kind of going, is, is Sir Ben Kingsley still in this film? And they give you a quick shot of him lying on the ground, having Morris come up and wake him up, and he goes on just pretending to be dead. I do wonder this was this was a movie that was shot up until February uh, 2020, uh, yeah. was shut down for COVID for over seven months, came back in October, I think, uh, of yeah. 2020. Um, I wonder if Ben Kingsley was one of the sacrifices they had to make for that. I know he was on the set for uh, for the big battle in in Tello. I know he obviously did this scene, but I'm not too sure whether they could get him back for as much as they may have wanted him for in the original script process. Yeah, possibly. I mean, it's interesting because you say he drops out. I do think he fades out. I mean, it, he doesn't have many speaking parts, but you're right. You know, he has the football moment where he's he's refing on, on um, a football match. You've got the, during the yeah. attack, you've got where he's at playing Dez. And, and he does set one of the, um, floating lanterns out onto the yeah. lake as well at the end. So I, I think, you know, for me, there's enough of him there that he's still around because he's, he's been brought to Tyrolo. Mm-hmm. So yeah, just for him to drop out completely would be weird. Um, and he serves that moment of the levity that he brings, connecting it to, the, you know, the last time we've had it, the yeah. 10 rings uh, yeah. through Iron Man 3. And, of course, finishes it off with the totally off-the-chart discussion about Planet of the Apes, um, which is just the most weirdest, wonderful, you know, dare I say, batshit crazy thing ever. Um, And I loved how Katie is like... Well, good on you. You went with your dreams. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you took something as crazy as that thought and sort of turned it into something. And I love the Shang-Chi in the back of the car with, with Jai Ling. Both of them are trying to work it out and they're going, hang on a second. Does he still think monkeys can act? <laughs> yeah. He still thinks the actors in Planet of the Apes were monkeys. Is that what it is? But that was the audience. And you're like, you're listening going, wait, wait. Oh, okay. Uh, um, so good. I, so I... The reason I asked the question is I, I'm the same. I, I'm the same as you guys. I absolutely love the addition here. I love the, the, it's not even the redemption because I don't think he needs a redemption, but it is the, the character re, uh, returning triumphantly. And it is the choice of Ben Sing Lee for the accents and the leaning into the Macbeth accent and the real 
hammed up Scottish sometimes kind of I kind of understood it but I know one or two people were like going what did he say wait what was that (laughs) okay um so I really enjoyed it I I loved it and yeah I think I'd say they would have tried to get him more but I probably like said COVID Mm -hmm. COVID and couldn't get him again for reshoots or whatever yeah Uh, but the just seeing him like lie down go yeah that plays into the character it's perfect it's like no lie down beside me this is the thing and just again no face pig (laughs) furry pig whatever we're calling them Mm. brilliant it's just so it, it I know it was, yeah, it's I, I a weird like, choice and it's a Disney thing and they want to make plushies and like everyone's like, Oh, they just added it so they can make a toy. I'm like, no, it actually works. Yes. Because it rolls over, it's a bit of again, they're comedic they're an element of comedic relief in these very tough kind of emotional scenes and elements. So it works. Yeah, and it is a really weird one. I know people have been saying that they added the character of Morris for plushies. Um, it is interesting that it's based on a mythical, mythical, yeah. magical creature from Chinese mythology. Um, and it doesn't work for me. I cannot imagine a parent buying a plushie of a faceless <laughs> character for their kid. It isn't something cute that you see on the shelf and you want to have if you're an eight year old kid or a six year old kid. This is something that maybe collectors might want for uh, for their rooms or something. But you would create something cuter uh, than Morris. You would create a Groot. You would create a, a rocket raccoon. You'd create something that's cute and kids would want to do if that's your intention. But the reason it works is that's not the intention. It is that it's weird and ugly and unusual and it does come from the mythology that they're that they're taking it from. But it's so cheap to make. Yeah. It's essentially a pillow. <laughs> it's a furry pillow yeah. with two wings yeah. with four wings. Very it's good. so cheap. I, it's perfect. It kind of reminded me somewhat of the the face huggers from Half Life. Actually, <laughs> uh, I, it, it was that. I mean, I know they don't have wings, but there was just something about it where it just reminded me of that. Not from Alien, but from Half Life. The walking yeah. potatoes that yeah. were uh, that were there. Uh, let's get on to the final battle at yes. Taolo because that is just uh, the first thing I suppose I want to say is that the, this is where I think. Trevor disappears and would probably have been in there if he was able to film. It's just yeah. where we do have that battle where everybody's tooling up, where we get everybody gets their moment of, you know, learning their weapon or, or practicing their skill. It's big, it's the fact that we get none of that from Trevor. We do have him uh, refereeing a football match early on, but we just don't see him getting into his, into his mode. So it doesn't feel like an existing character in the rest of the story from here. that That's, I suppose, the reason why I feel he's missing. But we do get this journey to the mystical city of Tello, um, and kind of the standoff between the two the two sides. I love that it's diffused really quickly by, uh, by Shang-Chi's aunt. She walks out as there's a big standoff from one side to Shang-Chi and, and Katie and Jai Ling. And goes, what are you people doing? <laughs> this is the this is the son of of Lee, one of our former wrestlers, my sister, you know. And that's the end of the the tension between both sides. Um, and then, yeah, they they kind of we, we kind of get the final version of hero Shang Chi here. Um, she explains to him the history of her mother, explains the history of the village, what they're there to protect. She explains to him the dweller in the darkness and the fact that they've been protecting this realm to ensure that that dweller in darkness doesn't break through the gate. To, to this dimension and then into the world to take over and kill everything in that world, take all the souls from that world. So, um, so we're talking about a new dimension here as well. This isn't just a hidden gate behind a waterfall that they've gone through and then there's a village behind it. This is a new dimension that they've gone through. Well, that's it. I mean, it's kind of the two interesting things here is when, when they've finally gone through that really, you know, aggressive bamboo forest, um, mm-hmm. That they go under a waterfall and it's like they travel through time and yep. space. Mm-hmm. But you have the, 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 the car coming through what looks like a water sling ring, mm-hmm. um, in, in effect. And um, this circular body of water as the car comes through into that. It also, so, that, you know, the, it, it's that idea of the mysticism around here, uh, the magical side of it, but also, you know, you have with Taolo, it's it's a hidden dimension or it's a hidden um, world, um, which is very, uh, has that similarity with, say, Kunlun from Iron Fist and the Seven Cities. Mm-hmm. Now, Taolo is not one of those 
heavenly cities, but maybe within the world, some of the larger cities that she referenced uh, um, in, in the backstory of uh, this whole world uh, would be one of them. But, you know, yeah. it, it is like with uh, Kun Lun. Uh, it is hidden and only accessible at certain times. Yeah. So, you know, th- th- this is really kind of sort of links and consistent with with the, these these other areas of, of the marvel world and, and i i thought um uh i i just had to keep reminding myself that the village of talo was effectively an outpost for some of these greater cities yeah and um, yeah i think when i was writing the synopsis and 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 so on it was like you know and shang chi saves the village and i was like this sounds really weird for a marvel <laughs> movie you know he said sa- he saves the world but it was it, you know this is ultimately a, a, an outpost really that defends this this dark gate yes. where you have the the dweller in the darkness, uh, being sort of uh, retained and and, and pr- imprisoned, yeah, and also surrounded by other mystical beasts from Chinese mythology as well. Which is, it's great to see some of those alive. I've seen a lot of these as statues on uh, outside buildings yeah. and uh, and in in artwork before, but I've never seen them created in in a movie before. So it's great to see those like lion dogs that, that I've seen so many times. Uh, I, in drawings before, but I've never seen in live action that, or in, in a movie before. I think it's great to see those alive uh, in this society. Some some just cool stuff in there in this in this kind of preservation village, I suppose. And you, the nine tail fox, yes, that you've seen in Lovecraft Country, yes, that's correct. Multiple, yes. yeah, yeah, there you go. Which we have seen recently. Yeah, check out episode eight of, uh, of Lovecraft Country. Um, I think yes. it is, or uh, maybe an episode and six. the finale, yeah. of course. Yeah. But that's um, spoilers. Yeah, really cool, really cool. Uh, seeing these uh, these creatures, these mythical creatures. You know, it's it, again, it's just showing that extra realm. And we like we've got dragons here in yeah. the MCU created in the city. We have the great protector coming out of the water, and it is a Chinese dragon. It doesn't have the uh, the traditional le- legs that you would see on a dragon from uh, from. British mythology, I guess. Well, it has it's T Rex mythology. legs. It almost. does have tiny yeah, little, it, tiny little wings, it, it, tiny little legs. It's the more serpent form of the dragon, which yeah. is really, really cool. It's really cool. And and as you say, John, you know, it's setting up the possibility of cities like Kun Lun, the expansion of the MCU to these mystical cities in other dimensions that play directly into our world and Earth. And we have obviously with Doctor Strange, we have him talking about multiple dimensions. We have um What If talked about multiple dimensions, and here we have a dimension directly connected to Earth which is a protective dimension stopping something attacking our world and and, and destroying it effectively. So <laughs> so I love this expansion here that we have in Shang-Chi. It's not, this story is a very focused story on a family, but uh, as with all good MCU stories, it's also opening up yeah. the possibilities for the universe of, of Marvel. Well, that's it. The, the Dweller in the Darkness is one of Doctor Strange's um sort of nemesis as well is mm-hmm. one of the uh the fear lords which nightmare is the the most well known of, of them as well so that is um you know that's again that other connection mm-hmm. uh, as i say he's technically immortal which um he certainly isn't by the end of this as he's okay. kind of you know he's been um sort of turned into shark chow, I guess. Yeah, well, let's talk um, a little bit about the fight as we kind of close out the movie because the fight is, is what leads right up to the end. We have um, Sean, Katie, and, and Jai Ling all becoming members of this army, effectively, versus yep. the Ten Rings. They all get their uh, their dragon scale armor, um, which is protecting them from uh, the, soul, uh, the soul suckers that are coming in. Um, so they are lucky, luckily in that protective position, but they also get to battle against the Ten Rings army as when Wu goes to try and free what he thinks is his wife from the dragon scale cave. So, um, so we do have army versus army, this great battle sequence on, uh, on the ground here at, in Tello. Exactly. You get that initial kind of like the, their shock taser kind of ropes. Um, and you see, you do see this. It, it's a, it's an interesting mysticism versus technology mm-hmm. quick fight. And as that kind of starts yeah. to continue, you get, uh, the you start to get that then brutal kind of Shang Chi versus Wenwu kind of father versus son battle piece that begins on the beach in the village and ends beside the gate. Yeah, the, this is where the emotion starts to be interspersed slowly 
with the fights where it's the discussion between father and son yeah. about the loss and why they they need they didn't need a a warlord they needed a father and things like that absolutely i think that, i think that's fantastic you already mentioned earlier on just that line from when we were he's blaming shang chi for the death of yeah. his wife you know he's he watched on is the way that when Wu's describing it it's like well he's eight years old and has zero training they were a rich family who were just sitting around uh in you know being a loving family unit and for some reason when Wu's blaming shang chi for the death and not standing in and not stepping in um to save his wife lee yet it is all when Wu's fault the reason why these people were there was to punish when Wu for what he did it had absolutely nothing to do with his family but Lee saved the kids by putting herself forward and taking out quite a few of them in the battle. <laughs> it must be said. Yeah. Um, but that is a really interesting battle between between Shang Chi and, and and his father. We mentioned earlier on that idea of embracing both sides of his history, all of his history, to be able to be the leader or be the person that he needs to be. Um, it's not just about beating his father; it's also about stepping up and taking over this mantle that he needs to embrace to become his real self. Yeah, I mean, I, I just I think the the final battle um, between Shang Chi and, and Wen Wu were, was really good. I mean, ultimately, one that um, they both understand the importance of of each other to one another, and mm-hmm. I, I think um, you know, and it's Shang Chi, you know, diffusing the power of his father uh, in, in the same way that uh, Lee did um, when they first. Uh, met in, yeah. in the bamboo forest yeah. so you know it's all these sort of these these mirrors and reflections um happening which i think is really really cool um, and yeah. and ultimately um as i say even with that the the the, the image of, of the turning shot as you look into when wu and you look at shang chi and um, it, it and it all sort of brings about a, a resolution to their um, their relationship to some extent, but when we ultimately has his his soul sort of taken out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, you, you see it with Shang Chi forming that fireball like uh, Lee did, mm-hmm. um, and instead of firing at him, uh, lets it go. Uh, so th- yeah, I, th- this was really really nice. Yeah. And and then and just that there is that moment of realization on Wen Wu's face that this is his son is his his wife's son as well as his own son. He can't control him. He can't force him into the dark path he's gone because he's also the son of his wife who he loved so much. There is that, just that, that expression that comes across Tony Leung's face as Shang-Chi uses his full power. And he realizes, wow, I've never really thought of him as my wife's son, which I think is a, a great moment. And that's just before he goes. And I like that there's a resolution to that family dynamic storyline before it gets into this final big battle the, this is the fun part because we do see the it is the final form of shang chi um, mm-hmm. because he gets the the rings and they are now his and they will be it's so subtle but just the choice to give him that the the, the blue power becomes this yellowy orange with mm-hmm. yeah. shang chi so subtle like such a just a, they, they could have gone with the blue but it just works so well absolutely just, call, just call as this back kind to of his mother doing exactly the same thing um, yeah meaning that he's closer to his mother in that moment than his father kind of thing so it is it is yeah. uh, that that a lovely touch to show the transition of power i suppose yeah exactly yeah. um and this um uh, essentially this battle opens the gateway to the dweller in darkness mm. who emerges from his uh, prison and kills one move. Uh, <laughs> just yeah. that's it. That's the he is gone. He gives up his rings to Shang Chi forever, and just lets himself go because he knows he is beyond that point, and he he cannot fight anymore. But it is a very touching moment. Yeah, yeah. it's the epitome just of the storyline that they're trying to tell exactly. about this kind of father mother love the duality, everything. It just all leads to this point where the yeah. father does then, after living thousands of years, has just essentially kind of given up and continues and goes into um, the beyond. Yeah, 
Yeah. And I think that's kind of established a bit earlier on with the, with the soul takers that are coming out of the, of the cave to, to take out all the members of the Ten Rings Society, all the defenders of the, of Tao Lo, how quickly the soul is taken. I don't think Wen Wu had much of a choice here. <laughs> Once he was in the no. grip of, uh, of the Dweller in Darkness, he's taken immediately, but he does give, have the opportunity to at least transfer the Ten Rings over to Shang-Chi before he dies. Um, and we did ha- I think we had to have this battle at the end. We had to have this moment where we see Shang-Chi at his full power because now we have him in the MCU as his full power itself with the Ten Rings, um, which I think is a great way to close out the movie, this, this final battle. And again, something that I really like about it is that everybody gets their moment. It's not just Shang-Chi has the Ten Rings. Now we can go and beat up the bad guy and win and win for everybody. It is that Jai Ling is on the back of the Great Protector. She's able to tie down the uh the dweller in darkness so that shang chi can get his moment um as dweller in darkness is trying to suck the soul out of the great protector we do have that moment where katie steps up uses her archery shoots it in the neck to distract it to stop it from sucking the soul out of out of the dragon and shang chi uses the rings to give it really bad indigestion push all 10 rings inside it spin them around and kill the dweller in darkness i think that's the immortal <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> exactly but i mean you know a repurposed um yes and uh, uh, the other thing i know slightly we have as katie later describes this is the mega soul sucker but we also there's the great mini soul suckers um mm-hmm. that can't be killed by the the weapons of the ten rings that's and that's a really great effect here um yeah. but the ten rings are something different and uh i kind of it looks like an arc reactor from tony stark sort of developing in the chest (laughs) of the 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 dweller and just sort of beginning to spin and spin and spin until yes um uh shark chum created ultimately yeah it's really yes. really cool but you're right that that scene with with uh with razor fist who's attacking one of the soul circles you see it you see him aiming his blade that's on his hand through their head and they just keep resizing rather than losing any limbs they just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller but still sucking the soul of uh of their prey effectively so i think it's a really good uh a really a really interesting way of using them the fact that they couldn't be killed by the uh by the ten ring society using their uh their advanced uh, weaponry as it is. Yeah, only the dragon scales, the gift of the great protector. Mm. Um, I love this fight scene at the end. Um, I was wondering how Shang-Chi would react in the future and kind of interact, I should say, in the future with the MCU mm-hmm. based on everyone is super powered. Yeah. And yeah. he is essentially just really good at martial arts. Mm-hmm. Um, they have now given him the Ten Rings and it allows him to be on the level of uh, of essentially fighting the, the 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 dweller in the darkness and things like that. Yeah. So he is now powered up. Um, but this explosion, this shark chum scene, for me is just visually beautiful. Mm. Just it all coming together with the spinning and him flying and in the the choice of the shot where you see the dweller you see the great protector and you see the water yeah and then you see shang chi slowly descending just as this little spot this dark spot in the center of the Mm -hmm. screen just spectacular choice yeah i thought the use of the water uh, by the great protector in terms of how it utilized it against the the dweller was just really good. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And it just then it, it, that's it. And then we get the the shark chum, as you say, the ending where they have this beautiful scene where they release lanterns for all the their lost ones, their mm-hmm. mothers, their fathers, their sisters, and their brothers. Um, and it's a beautiful uh, capstone, which is then. <laughs> Comedically placed into the story of them essentially telling their friends yeah. about that the 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 super sucker and how they shot the arrow and then how he did his whirly thing with his rings. Yeah. Lo- um, I love this. I love the response from from their friend. Is uh, you're just telling me this because I told you to grow up last week. You made this yeah. uh, you made this idiotic childish story up just to have fun with me, effectively, which I love. And of course, punctuated by Wong's arrival. Uh, so- Whisk them away to Kamertash. Yeah, really, really like that as the ending for the movie, um, showing that they're now part of the universe. And I like that Wong is bringing both Katie and Shang-Chi with him as well. 
Yes. This for me was just the, this was the, the beautiful ending. Yeah. And it is. It's just, you get huge action, emotional beat, yeah. comedy. And it's just in those three scenes at the end, you get the understanding again of what the film is. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And then that's it. That is the ending of Shang Chi. Kind of. Let's get into the yeah the notes of the uh, the mid credit scenes um, because there are two as usual in uh, in Marvel Universe one taking place directly after that closing. Um, the first first scene in the credits is that the ten rings are being inspected. That's why Shang Chi and uh, and Katie have been brought to Camertage uh, with Wong. Bruce Banner looking very on smart Hulk, um, I guess, looking, yeah. looking back to himself again, uh, and Carol Danvers. Um, so there's yeah. an interesting little idea in here. The Ten Rings are sending out some message to the universe, to some other planet. Again, I mentioned right at the beginning that there's no explanation of where the Ten Rings came from. The Ten Rings. Some say they found it in a crater. Yes. Some say he found it on a, in a cave. Yeah. yeah. And exactly. it could be neither of those things. It could be that they were transferred from another planet, as seems to be the case here in, yeah. in this closing. And with Wong, Bruce and Carol, both, you know, this is not, um, any technology or space artifact or magical, um, uh, artifact that they are, that they can see. Yeah. Uh, you know, way older than a thousand years and yeah sending out this message and um, so yeah. and it was felt in Kamataj the yeah. first time shang chi used them mm. when he used them that's right as uh, yeah so i i, I enjoyed this because it, it does lean into the potential origin of what the ten rings are being yeah. alien in nature uh, and things like that and i don't think they're going to go down the the pre pre comic book route now i think this is something we're into unknown territory mm -hmm. and it's going to be fun yeah um it really is it's just that unknown yeah uh there is um only one worry that i have i want shang chi on earth uh for at least one more movie um or at least five more movies to be honest every appearance that i want him in i want him on earth i don't want shang chi in a spaceship uh Marvel has tended to do this in comic books over the last 10 years where everything has to center, center around space and attacks from other planets and uh, other creatures from other planets. And they literally have said this here with that the Ten Rings are from another planet. Will Shang-Chi be fighting aliens in the next movie? I really hope not. I hope we can find, they can find another story to tell on Earth because this one was so well centered in a grounded storyline. And I really don't need every single MCU character in space. No, I think it's going to be the origin of the rings. I think that's the next one. Yeah. I really do think it's going to be that. And I think it's going to be the, the on Earth, a bit like Tomb Raider, they're off to find where their dad found the rings going mm -hmm. through. That's how they bring back when we, that's how they bring back the flashbacks. That's essentially it's okay, let's talk about, let's look at our father throughout history and follow his steps to find it, backwards to find the origin of the Ten Rings, the organization and the uh, the uh, actual rings themselves. That would be great. Um, we don't unfortunately have a Shang-Chi 2 confirmed uh, just Not yet. yet. We've only out uh, 45 days and then only on, on Disney+. Plus. Um, but we don't have a, a have a second Shang Chi confirmed. There are a few rumors that uh, that there will be a Shang Chi too. I think, given the team behind this movie, um, everybody involved, I hope, comes back into the MCU mm -hmm. and does something in the future. Because I think everybody's was so dedicated in, in what they delivered. What we do have with our post credit scene is uh, Zhai Ling has taken over the Ten Rings organization from her father. We see that the uh, the Ten Rings emblem. Uh, has been recreated uh, for Zhao Ling. It looks different to the one that uh, the, the one cursed that lotus has um, her logo. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so she has taken over it, and we do end the movie with the Ten Rings will return. Not Shang Chi will return. The Ten Rings will return, which is really interesting uh, to see what will happen with Zhao Ling. Yeah, but he yeah. also has the actual Ten Rings. He does. So, yeah, it can mean two things. It can mean yeah. two things. So the the current rumor is that Shang Chi two the film is in script pre-production that they're writing everything up and that the 10 rings is going to be a disney plus show right that is the current rumor mm -hmm. um, now again it's the internet it's rumors none of this is on deadline or hollywood reporter so right it's all like who knows it's throw it everything at the wall and something good could happen but given all of the announcements of disney plus shows that came out yesterday um anything could be possible exactly that's where i'm kind of like it all makes sense when the when it makes that much sense i'm like yeah okay 
Yeah. But let's wait and see. It will be interesting because I can see a Ten Rings martial arts Disney Plus show being very cool. Absolutely, that could be really interesting yeah. to see. And I completely forgot one of the elements of the uh, of the post credit scenes. Um, Wong and Shang Chi and uh, and. Katie going off to karaoke, just like they used to do in the old days. So they may have grown up and accepted their future purpose, but they'll still be willing to go off and have a bit of a fun night at karaoke, even yeah. if the world no, I like uh, that leaves them to sleep and rest. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping they get a short post credit in uh, Doctor Strange 2, where we see Wong and them in just in the background drinking or something. Yeah, that would be very cool. Uh, yeah. We know Wong is coming up next month in, in Spider-Man Far From Home, so um, yep. potentially uh, he is going off to beat up with Shang-Chi. Uh, maybe that'll be the connection that we'll see uh, in that movie. I think that's it for the movie. Any any notes that we may not have talked about? I think we've talked about a lot there, so I'm not sure. If I am um, noted out. Excellent. Yeah, me too. Excellent. Well then, John, do you defend Marvel's Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings? Yes, I really defend um, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. I give it five chicken pigs out of five. <laughs> um, to me, this is my perfect uh, Marvel movie, to be honest. Um, and I thought this was done so so well by everyone um that was involved the actors the crew the the creators the writers the director all of this was just right in uh my wheelhouse and um, I, I thought the music was great i just loved how it built and was epic um i loved the action here um whether it was on the bus on the scaffolding it in the the fight pit of the golden daggers i love this whole new uh world and um, brought into marvel connecting it to you know through wong as well to the sanctum and, and to the avengers with with carol danvers and, and with the hulk um Talo, the dragon, oh my goodness, so, so good. You know, as, as an Iron Fist fan as well, this is like really, um, in that wheelhouse as well. Um, I think Simu Lu, um, Aquafina, uh, I absolutely adored their relationship and Simu Lu and, um, uh, Tony Leung, uh, really, really cool. For me, Tony Leung was, absolutely phenomenal throughout yeah. this i love the use of flashbacks as i say i do in believe for myself and um, he is the most complex um best uh written um and probably the best story coming out of a single movie for a in quotes bad guy that has been in the marvel uh universe uh to date um in terms of um, his relationship with his wife, his family, um, and it, it just was really sort of, it was deep, it was funny, it was emotional, it was action filled, it was magical, it was mystical, and it, and it was Trevor Slattery's as well. Um, so for me, five chicken pigs out of five. Um, Chris, do you defend, uh, this movie, uh, Shang-Chi? Yes. A hundred percent. It's beautifully aesthetic. Mm -hmm. the cinematography, the action sequences, just fantastic. The uh, the emotional beats and the the story it tells, still on second viewing at mm -hmm. home when there was no annoying people around, still made me well. Still made me kind of go, "Wow, that was nice," and. It still, even on second viewing, didn't lose any of that luster and sheen and shine that it had. Um, so from the choice of the actors to the, the choice of everything, just the, everything about this made me just be happy. It, it is a good origin. Again, like has some of the Marvel issues, i.e., like, we we're not quite sure where everything is going, and also they kill theoretically their their main bad guy. Uh, actually, both main bad guys. One's Shark Chum, and the other is just soul sucked. Um, but that's okay because there are options for where it can go in the future, and like we can, like we said, go backwards in time, flashbacks, and all that fun in games. Um, so I'm just interested to see where it goes, and I will watch this again. 
Uh, and right now it is my top MCU film of the year over the Eternals, over uh, Black Widow. Um, because for me, this did what I wanted to do. It was that ultimate beautiful popcorn action flick with a heart, which is the MCU. Derek, do you defend Shang-Chi and the Legend of Ten Rings? Everybody gets one. This was f- brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every show gets one. Uh, that was it. I'll do my own editing on that one. Uh, I really, really enjoyed this. This is, this is probably the best solo Marvel movie that I've seen since Doctor Strange. And Doctor Strange just has a special place for me because it's Doctor Strange and I love the character. Um, but this is fantastic. I was looking back at my notes, the amount of times I mentioned Shang-Chi and how much I was interested in seeing this character Um over the last five or six years, I've mentioned the character and wanted to see him in movies so much. But what they've delivered here, the from the cast to the director to the writers, what they've delivered in this story is something really special for the MCU. I'm so glad I got to see it in the cinema. I'm so glad I got to watch it again before uh, we talked about it in the podcast because watching it in the cinema afterwards, I came out with exactly the feeling I used to come out of action movies as a kid going, wow, I want to be able to do all those moves. And I thought I might have liked it too much. I might have been giving it too much. But seeing it a second time, having exactly the same emotional reaction to a lot of the scenes, to the comedy, to the uh, to the heart of the movie, confirms to me that I wasn't overselling it in my mind after watching it in the cinema. Um, this is a great Marvel movie. I hope they can keep up this kind of quality on all of the movies that they do in the MCU, bringing in people that are really passionate about the projects, people who have a real different perspective than other movies in the past. I kind of joked that we're in phase four now and phase one to three was the story of Iron Man and the Avengers. Basically, to Iron Man fans, that's what those were. This now feels like something new. We're moving into new territory. And if they if they hit this quality in future, I'm, I'm, I'm in for every MCU movie uh, going forward. Great, great example of what they can do. Exactly. Great stuff. Let's get into some feedback from our fellow defenders. First up, an email from Coffee and Vodka, who says, Greetings, cinematic defenders. This felt like a welcome return to form to the MCU for me. Shang-Chi was great from start to finish. The casting of Simu Liu in the title role was perfect, and Aquafina stole every scene she was in. My problems with Iron Man 3 were many-fold, the worst in the MCO run, in my opinion, but Ben Kingsley's fake Mandarin, however, was not one of them. In both Iron Man 3 and Hail to the King the Short, he played the role to perfection, and it was great to see him return here as Yuan Wu's theatrical course jester. Tony Leung's performance as the actual Mandarin gave us a villain of multiple layers and threat yeah. without a bit of cheese. The writing, music, plotting, dialogue, cinematography, special effects, and most especially fight choreography were excellent. This one's a multi-watcher. Loved that dragon. I just have one question. If not to show the way to the gate guard and the bad thing which must not be released, what was the point of the gems in the necklaces given to Shang-Chi and his sister Zhai Ling by their mother? Ten out of five rings for me for this movie. Take care and peace. Coffee and vodka. Um, that's an interesting question. I think it's just simply that uh, there is a moment with Lee where she gives the stone to uh, Shang-Chi and says he can go back home if he uses the stone. Yeah. So I don't think she ever intended to, to get back to Wen Wu. It was all about the two of them as brother and sister being able to get home to her home of Tello, right? Yeah. Um, were they initially her guidance to get her home, potentially? Maybe that was it? And um, that she was able to use the stones, and then she handed them off to her children? Um, I think that was it. I think they were kind of two sides of a single... Gem mm. and they were kind of a single pendant, and then she split them again to the two kids. As if you ever want to go back to your ancestral place, yeah, yeah. follow these. Yeah. If you want to go and visit your auntie, yeah, your exactly. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's exactly how I took it. It was, it just so happens there was also the dark gate there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and but yes, it was to get to that world, um, I think, and and certainly. Um, I'm totally uh, with you, coffee and vodka around Aquafina and Simu Liu, as well as Tony Leung as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is really, really great, uh, a great movie. Absolutely, absolutely. Just thought about it there while you were talking. Uh, so Wen Wu wants his kids to follow in his footsteps, or at least Shang-Chi to follow in his footsteps to become the leader of the Ten Ring Society. Mm-hmm. Potentially, Li wanted her, her kids to follow in her footsteps and become protectors of this game. Yeah. So yep, she asked for 
some um, dragon scale armor to be made for them. Exactly. So yeah. she, left, final she left that key behind so they could maybe take over in her footsteps. Yeah. New, yeah, n- new, knew their measurements. Uh, exactly, which is amazing, yes. especially because she didn't see them for yeah. many years. Yeah. Magic is great. You know, I said, that, great. I said that last night as a joke when we watched the movie, and John instantly said, it's a magical plane where there's dragons and loads of creatures <laughs> from, myth, from myth, and you can't accept that they would be able to get the size right of these kids going to visit them. <laughs> Like, okay, but right. yes, yes. No, I, I even I was like, hey, kind of bit. Yeah. Now we also have an email from O eight four, um, who had this to say: As an Asian American, I can't tell you how happy I am to have gotten to see some authentic representation on the big screen in this universe. I've loved so much. Shang Chi was exciting, funny, inspiring, and even heartbreaking. I was very impressed with how sympathetic the villain was, with his villainous characteristics being psychological. Wen Wu was a bad man who found love and genuinely changed his stripes, but unfortunately let his capacity for good depend entirely on one person. And when that one person went away, he didn't believe he could be a good man, so he wasn't. My favourite scene might have been the confrontation between him and Shang-Chi at Yiling Shine, then outside of it. Their words hit each other just as hard as their combat, yeah. and both were expertly written and choreographed. Mm-hmm. Before I ramble on too long about everything else I loved about this film, I'll end with a question. Do you think Wong lets Shang-Chi keep the Ten Rings, and do you want him to use them going forward? I know his 616 counterpart mainly relies on hand-to-hand combat, yeah. so I'd be curious to see if he uses these world-conquering weapons in the MCU, and how he matches up power-wise to the other adventures because of him. Until next time, OA4. Thanks so much, OA4, for that. Um, this, yeah, this was kind of where I was going with, I think, he has been given these 10 rings so he can essentially measure up with other Avengers. So he can fight alongside the Bruce Banners, the Carol Danvers, the other new Avengers that will go. Um, cause he is essentially, yeah, he's a man who can punch stuff, much like Hawkeye is a man who can shoot an arrow. They have strengths elsewhere and there's different levels of bits. I do think Shang-Chi is being groomed to be something bigger. I think he's being groomed to be able to fight, as you said, with that world conquering level of power. I don't think he'll use them all the time because that just makes him OP. But I, like, I think they'll, they'll, they'll figure a way to bring him down and then give him back the power. For our non-gamer listeners, OP means overpowered. Uh, just, just so you know. Sorry, yes, I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks Sorry. so much for that. Oh, for for your feedback. I, I, I would agree with Chris uh, in in a way. Um, what I absolutely love about what they've done here with the Ten Rings is that they've given them to Shang Chi, but he doesn't need to use them. Um, yeah, exactly. It is that they have options where he can stand up side by side with Thor, and they have options where he can fight hand to hand alongside Black Widow or, or Hawkeye. So he effectively could be the entire range of everybody that's been in the Avengers in the past. Which would be awesome. Truly talented, truly uh, gifted in his abilities at fighting, but he also now has an overpowered weapon that if it gets taken away from him, he can still be a hero. Yeah, definitely. And to be honest, I'm I'm happy either way, whether he is simply on the hand-to-hand combat, more uh, like, say, Peter Parker, Spider-Man to some extent, or or Hawkeye. But um, yeah, I know he's got the webs, (laughs) but I, I do, like... It is it, the the comics leading up to this okay. uh, the Shang Chi run, um, you know, has him mainly on hand to hand combat. Yeah. There there are no ten rings to aid him yeah. uh, here, so um, I, I think they can alternate his power. It might be that Wong um, will at a future date take them away once they find out what's this pulse. You know, where have they come from? Mm-hmm. What exactly um, is their origin and power um, and it could be that it's something that he will lose and um, move him forward as well. Yeah. And I'm totally with you, 084, on Wenwu as well. And I just think such so good. I've I've said it way too many times already this podcast, but um, totally with you there. So uh, yeah, thanks so much uh, for the feedback um, from 084. Uh, we also got an email through from Michael Booth. Um, 
Michael says, Hey guys, I just thought I'd put some feedback in for Shang-Chi. First up, I'm so glad I caught this at the cinema. I was going to wait until it hit uh, Disney+, Plus, but I had a spare afternoon, so I caught it right at the end of its run. So much of the spectacle would have been lost on the small screen, and I don't think those fight scenes would have looked nearly as good. I really enjoyed the movie. The story was fun. It felt connected to the MCU characters. The characters were mostly excellent, and both the imagery and the music was brilliant. Mm. I wasn't overly sold on Aquafina's character. At the beginning, she seemed very much playing Aquafina rather than the character. I had warmed to her by the end, though. Do you think we might see a second Archer show up in Hawkeye? Ooh, uh, it. it was good to get a resolution to the Mandarin's character, but I found him a little annoying at the time. He was performing dead. I'll be happy if we don't see him again. As usual, Michelle Yeoh was a goddess. She is fantastic in everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, the fight scenes were excellent, especially those that leaned into the stylistic elementism with the wind. They were well choreographed and had good weight and flow. Mm -hmm. Finally, the two end credits were fun. I enjoyed having Wong show up and having Carol and Banner inspecting the rings. Can't wait to see what that brings. Also, I enjoyed Zha Ling's version of dismantling the compound. <laughs> Expected from the moment she talked about building her empire, but it looks like an interesting way forward into Shang-Chi 2. Can't wait to hear what you guys think. Cheers, uh, Michael. Thanks uh, so much, Michael. Yeah, thanks so much, Michael. That's a, a great question to see whether we get a, a second Archer show up in the form of Katie. A third oh, Archer. Well, indeed, yes. a third Archer. Uh, yeah, we know yeah. we're going to see Kate Bishop, we know we're going to see Hawkeye, but I'd love to see uh, Aquafita come in. Wouldn't it be interesting? That would be really cool. Potentially there's some connection there. Maybe Kate Bishop learned a little bit of uh, her archery from um, from Aquafina uh, after her return wouldn't that be a little interesting touch? Uh, you never know. You never you know. Never know. Uh, um, and certainly, you're right. Michelle Yeoh uh, just fantastic uh, as well here. Um, I I think for me, the war she's um, fighting with or, or practicing the fighting with Shang Chi uh, uh, just really uh, superb. And that elementism, as you say, just really stylistic really evocative i think yeah. great stuff michael thanks so much for your feedback we also have some feedback from becky mullins he says hi Derek, chris and john as this is probably the one and only time i've seen a marvel movie before you record i wanted to send in my thoughts on shang chi combined with my thoughts on the eternals as i didn't see it in time for your podcast on that film Becky says, I had quite high expectations going into Shang-Chi. The reviews had been good. I knew that Wong and the Abomination were going to make an appearance, and I had enjoyed the humour in the trailers. I felt like it was your standard Marvel fair, and I enjoyed it for that, but I wasn't amazed by it and desperate to see it again, like I was when I came out of Black Widow, which I think is one of my favourite Marvel films. I can appreciate that Shang-Chi is a good movie, and I understand why it is so significant, but if I'm being honest, I did get a bit bored during the fight sequences, although I think that's because I'm not a big fan of martial arts films. Contrast that with how I felt going into The Eternals. I had no expectations, no idea how it was going to connect into the MCU, introduce all these new characters, and I hadn't even bothered watching the trailers. The reviews, as you discussed in your podcast, hadn't been great, and to top it all off... I am not a fan of Angelina <laughs> Jolie, and I don't like Game of Thrones. The film was a bit of a slow build, but it didn't feel like nearly two and a half hours, and when I came out, I was pretty sure I enjoyed it, and I definitely know I preferred it to Shang-Chi, controversially. A bit like Derek, I needed to let it sink in a bit, and now that I've listened to your podcast, I've decided I really did like it, and I'm looking forward to seeing the movie again. So I think the lesson learned here is not to read reviews and to not judge a film by its cast. I'm excited to see how all of these new characters weave into future films. Thank you once again for your podcast. They really do enhance my enjoyment of all things Marvel. Becky. Thank you, Becky. That's really nice of you, yeah, Becky. Thank you really so much. good. Yeah. And to be honest, I think this just is shows the the diversity of how people come in, in to watch movies and what they yeah. take away from it. You, you're right. If... if you haven't watched or aren't a fan of martial arts films, you know, it, it puts a different spin Absolutely. on how you view the, the film. Um, and, you know, I, I'm totally with you. You know, the, the, the reviews, the, you know, the overload of teasers and trailers and, and uh, the the prejudgment of movies based on all that stuff as well. I mean, it's part of the reason I've always gone into christopher nolan movies where it is so sparse what he gives you uh, and i guess for marvel um 
There's so much lore, so much comic history, so many ideas, and yeah. so many people's favorites. Um, and so many podcasts. And so, so many, many podcasts. Yeah, exactly. And, that, that, throw out, throwing out ideas of what... I think there's a great line from Kevin Feige recently where he said the biggest challenge they now have in the MCU is dealing with the expectations of fans yeah. because the fans that write down this is what I must see on screen exactly and then get disappointed if they don't see it are now becoming massively vocal in this in this new world where, where we live now it, um, it, I think it almost goes slightly beyond expectation mm-hmm. into preconditioning is that okay. people are are becoming preconditioned to go and say yes that was too much of a slow build for Eternals it wasn't you know that it is one way or the other whether that stands up into reality i don't know but yeah. you you get the narrative building and that's what it's remembered for and you know I, I i think people have a wonderful set of diverse reasons why they they love adore like think is okay think it's me uh, about any movie mm-hmm. uh, and that is uh, a really interesting um, bit of feedback there, Becky. Uh, yeah. I love that stuff. I love getting other people's vi- opinions, and uh, yeah, yeah, I love I love getting other people's opinions after I watch the movie. <laughs> that's yeah, that's always what I go for. We tend to always try and get to the premiere night or the first night for uh, for Marvel movies specifically, and that's mostly because we, when we podcast, we want to talk about it pretty fresh without other people's opinions in our heads. And what we mentioned on the Eternals podcast was that was quite difficult this time. It seemed like even if you were trying to avoid reviews, you very much heard this has been getting negative reviews about the Eternals. Even if you weren't reading the reviews, it seemed like every headline was the movie has been getting negative reviews. So uh, so we were saying we did kind of go in with that in the back of our mind. And I still don't understand why it got those kind of negative reviews. There are certainly been way worse movies released in the last year, let alone in the MCU over its entire uh, timeline. Thanks so much, Beggy. Uh, let's get over to Facebook and go on some feedback from Facebook. Yes, first up, we have some from David Wang, who said, The spoken Mandarin language in this movie is very good. The hard-coded English subtitles, not so much. <laughs> Hens, <laughs> Excellent. Issue, isn't it? Um, in, in translating movies from one language to another, you tend to miss out some of the... Um, some of the central ways of, of saying things. At least it's not as bad as they used to be for old martial arts movies in the 70s. I was watching a documentary actually about, uh, about some of the movies that were moved over from, uh, from, uh, China and Korea during the 70s when there was that massive kung fu explosion in, yeah. in, in New York. And they were saying it was basically, uh, four English speaking guys stood in a room, looked at the lips of each of the characters to see if they could match words to those lips and had no idea what the story was. <laughs> they were just trying to match English words to the it lips. It was so funny. So, uh, so no storyline, no translation, just simply, um, I guess this is what he could be saying if we put an English voice over <laughs> yeah, the top of it. So, exactly. Uh, so a, a strong tradition of uh, bad translation uh, in, in martial arts movies over the, over the history. <laughs> yeah. Yes. If you enjoy that type of stuff, Kung Pao, enter the fist. Is an amazing film. Good. Good. Yeah. Doinky, 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 doinky. It's Good okay. stuff. Yeah, thanks, David. <laughs> uh, I think this is the first time you've you, you've uh, provided feedback since Hannibal. It might be. Um, so that's uh, it's good to have uh, that that little bit of feedback in uh, since uh, the days we covered Hannibal. Yeah, which was only the last season as well. So yeah, it was such a uh, missed opportunity. Anyway, <laughs> let's move on um, to some more Facebook uh, feedback as well from Ronaldo. Uh, Ray says. Having read A Large Slab of Master of Kung Fu, uh, Doug Mensch wrote an epic series back in the 70s. I initially fell into the camp of this isn't my Shang-Chi of the comics. But after that initial adjustment, I must say that I really enjoyed this introduction into another facet of the MCU. Mm -hmm. Having such a rich culture as Chinese mythology to be a part of the MCU, and now with the Eternals introducing Arthurian legend, is just a dream come true for me. Whilst it's amazing to see Asgard and Norse mythology thrive in the films, expanding the scope to include all other sorts of lore just makes the palette of the MCU and its possibilities endless. Uh, don't get me started on Egyptian mythology. Indeed, Khonshu. Um, <laughs> similarly, 
uh, and Aquafina are so likable as the leads and the theme of taking on a family's dynasty and free will versus destiny was entertaining. Tony Leung for me was the standout. I sorely hope he returns somehow as Wen Wu, the legendary figure and intertwining that with the comic book Mandarin. It just adds so much gravitas to him and Leung pulls it off effortlessly. Yes. The- the action scenes were amazing, and if I was to make a quibble, I'd just say that it was unfortunate that we didn't get grander scenes or send-off for Death Dealer. Such a mysterious character, their death, I guess, had an impact in that it was so innocuous. True. <laughs> I so hope we get a trilogy of Shang-Chi movies, as there is so much that can now be tied into the likes of Eternals, in particular Dane Whitman, The Black Knight, both work for the British Secret Service in some capacity. Though it may not be the way the MCU will go, the fact that the MCU has opened up so much with the last two films is testament to how endless the possibilities are with the source material at hand. Finally, I totally didn't expect but loved the kaiju finale. Again, perhaps a finale showcasing Shang-Chi's martial arts would have been great, but they managed to subvert my expectations and to have dragons now roaming around in the MCU, what more can a comic book tragic like myself want? (laughs) All the best chaps, keep up the stellar coverage. Uh, Just listen to your discussion on the Eternals and I just absolutely enjoyed your chat. Agreed with you all on that film. I thoroughly enjoyed it and place it higher than what some sites would have placed uh, it compared to other films. Derek, how dare you? Ant-Man is great. Uh, Damn right. (laughs) Well, I bundled it in with all the comedy movies. I was using Ant-Man as an example, but you know it's actually Guardians of the Galaxy and Thor Ragnarok that I mean. I just happen ah, to roll now. in. Ah, now. How dare you, let's, Derek? Let's indeed. move on. Let's yes. move on. Yes. Oh. Get over it. Yes, yeah. indeed. Thanks so much, Ray. Uh, I, I'm totally with you. The idea that we've got, um, you know, knights and Arthurian legend and mm-hmm. now, um, you know, the whole Chinese mythology is fantastic. Um, and yeah, we again, it, it, it's... It's it's repeating what we've said, you know. Tony Leung um, stand out t- absolutely, yes. um, and just you know having these additional layers of whether it's dragons, whether it's Chinese mythology, whether it's um, the the British uh, Secret Service in some capacity. There are endless possibilities, as you say, and um, it is really... We're going to have Egyptian mythology soon enough, um, I guess, with with old Moon Knight. So, I mean, I'm waiting for Scarab Beetles to come along and do something pretty shocking um, as well. So, yeah, good stuff. Uh, thanks uh, for that feedback, and we're glad you really enjoyed the Eternals coverage as well. Yeah. Thanks, Ray. Uh, Over on Facebook still, we have feedback from Victor Von Doom. We said, regarding the subtitles, a lot can get lost in translation. Mm -hmm. Loved the action and plot. Cinematic songs and soundtrack were also great. As an old school martial arts movie fan, two thumbs up. By the way, pour one out for the late, great Sonny Chiba. Absolutely, yeah. Sonny Chiba, a a mainstay of martial arts movies uh, during the the 70s and 80s. I think my introduction to him was probably from uh, True Romance, the Quentin Tarantino written movie, yeah. Yeah. Uh, where the, the movies that uh, Clarence was watching in the cinema when he meets Alabama are uh, Street Fighter and Sister of the Street Fighter, both starring Sonny Chiba. And, I, and that was one of my favorite movies from about 10 years, True Romance. So I had to go out and watch uh, Sonny Chiba and see uh, what he was like as a martial artist. Great martial artist. Uh, great Japanese movies. Um, those ones. Uh, thanks, Victor. We also had some feedback from Brandy Elise Anderson, who says, Even before I saw Eternals, I thought the rings would tie into that somehow. The look and sound seem similar to some of the looks and sounds for Eternals in the trailers. And since Bruce said the rings are far older than the thousand years Shang-Chi's father had them, it could be a strong possibility. Mm. I haven't seen this movie since opening night, Shang-Chi. Now this rewatch makes me want to go and see Eternals again right away to see if my theory holds up. Ooh, did the Ten Rings come to the planet along with the Eternals that or is, after the Eternals? Yeah, that is a good, good call. Yeah. No connection that I can remember from the actual movie, but as no. we say, that that movie kind of 
uh, talked about what six and a half thousand years in about forty minutes. So uh, there's certainly things that uh, that weren't on screen that that certainly could have been caused by the Eternals. So uh, so very interesting. Yes, graphic. yeah, absolutely. This is the, the the these are the theories why I podcast. Uh, thank you, Brandy. I love that. Even if it turns out not to be true. It's just so good because that makes it really exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't mm-hmm. be able to sleep tonight. You'll be able to sleep tonight. No, because think... I'll be thinking about all the yeah possibilities. I think if we continue recording this podcast, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. so well, yes. indeed. So, yeah, thanks so much, Brandy. Over on Twitter, Matt Murdick at Musical Concept says Ten Rings is a fantastic origin story. If nothing else giggled and cried it's tough to break the top 10 in the mcu this one at least came close to doing that for me interesting uh very mm. interesting yeah well at least it went for that and it it tried to break you down matt um to to get into your top 10 didn't quite succeed but it it, it did with me i have to say I, I, yeah. I think he's given that a massive compliment 20, no, I 26 movies I now agree. in the mcu so um i think if it broke the top 10 after one or two views, that that would be massive, wouldn't it? Exactly. Just wait when you onto your fifth view, and you, who knows, it may even be in the top ten. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We also have some feedback from Claire Payne. Claire says, "Brilliant film, definitely a film you can rewatch over and over again." I uh, definitely, Claire. I think this is going to be on rewatch for a long time. And mm-hmm. um, certainly, I want to rewatch it already. Uh, I only watched it on Friday, so yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I think I'm going to uh, go ahead and get the Blu-ray of it so we have it just in case the internet goes out occasionally. <laughs> as well, absolutely. <laughs> Always Thank- think ahead. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Claire. Uh, Doctor Bob Phillips says we loved this film. Started off with the legends and the one shot to get us in the mood. Even with that, I didn't expect this level of humor. The fights were superb and we particularly loved the dancing and natural magic of Tao Lo. I had a feel of Brazilian capoeira. Would love to echo the call for a trio of movies in this corner of the universe, ending with the three doing karaoke. <laughs> Single ladies next time, maybe? <laughs> I love it. Wong re- reprising his uh, his love of Beyonce uh, at, at karaoke. Yeah, karaoke. absolutely. <laughs> that would be a good call. Good I call. S- absolutely. I see what you mean about, uh, about the Brazilian capoeira as well. That's a, that's kind of like a dance fighting style as well, which is quite similar to the to the kind of scene with Lee and Wen Wu and, uh, and again with Shang-Chi and, and Wen Wu at the end, a kind of much more of a dance fight. Uh, that's going on yeah definitely um yeah love that 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 style of of the fighting Mm -hmm. uh really good glad you enjoyed bob thanks so much for the feedback absolutely but gentlemen that is the end of our feedback for this epic that is shang chi the epic film the epic feedback the epic podcast and everything in between if you enjoyed what you heard Please make sure you subscribe at tvpodcastindustries.com. Please remember you can also support us on patreon.com slash tvpodcastindustry where for just one ring or ten rings oh. you can support us and keep the engines on, the lights going, the hamsters in the wheels or the hamsters in the rings. Actually, that's even better. <laughs> They're Shang-Chi themed uh, hamsters right now. You can also give us a quick one off. Uh, a kind of support by going to buymeacoffee.com slash tvpi where you can keep our illustrious editor in caffeine because he's going to need it when he's doing this podcast. Do you know what? Usually when we're recording these podcasts and they go over about an hour and a half or over two hours, I'm usually trying to wind the guys up and get the podcast <laughs> shut down early, but shang was such a f- good movie that I wanted to talk about it for as long as possible. Two? It deserved it. Uh, it deserved yes. this kind of coverage because... It's so good. Can't wait to see more. We have loads more stuff coming up on TV Podcast Industries. As Chris said, make sure you subscribe to the podcast because next month we're going to be staying in the MCU. We're going to have uh, Spider-Man No Way Home, uh, the did 27th did movie. Did did oh, oh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we will also be staying in the MCU for Hawkeye, which we saw a new clip of yesterday uh, on Disney Plus Day. Go check that out. It's a really interesting clip. That's coming out from the 25th of November with two episodes of the six-episode season uh, and then one episode a week for the following four weeks. And we will be exiting the MCU, going over to m- more mythical creatures and more magical um, encounters on Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time, which begins on Amazon Prime from the 19th of November, next Friday as we record today. Uh, that starts off with three episodes, a three-hour epic, uh, longer than a Lord of the Rings movie uh, on day I one. I know. I know. It's going to be great. And we're gonna talk the about- wheel weaves as the will 
Wills. Well done, Chris. Well done. Exactly. We will be practicing that uh, before we start our coverage on the. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, yeah. But make sure you subscribe to the podcast. If you subscribe to TV Podcast Industries, you will get our coverage of all of those things. So thanks very much for joining us for Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. We'll talk to you next time. Bye. Yeah, thanks so much, fellow defenders, for joining us and having the discussion. I think I'm starting to get bed sores uh, with the length of this podcast. But remember, keep watching, keep listening, and keep defending. Bye. also bringing in dragons here um which is kind of huge for the marvel universe you know some some of the elements you mentioned about you know this kind of sets up the possibility that there are cities like kunlun in the end <coughs> where the hell is my voice just gone <coughs> in the end uh, i guess i i guess i'm moon knight um <laughs> <laughs> please leave that in